urge even kids, you know, because every kid is an artist, every kid, you know, they just get distracted as they grow up and find other things. But we have to keep to traditional art, draw, paint, you know, let's do it, let's, let's not lose this art. So that's my, uh, you know, that's my plan, that's my hope, my dreams. I'm at the grand opening of the boulevards at West River, and I can't wait to show you everything this incredible complex has to offer. The boulevards at West River truly represent the next step in affordable housing. It's made for multi-generational families across all income brackets. Each of the three towers are home to more than 100 units, and they're leasing right now Priority housing is being given to residents who needed to be relocated from the former North Boulevard homes. The city of Tampa provided $1 million in federal funds to this project. It takes teamwork, it takes the city, the county, the elected officials, but it also takes the community because this is a community driven project and the community has been waiting 50 plus years to get where we are. It's going to be a walkable community. It's going to be a real community. It's going to be a community that is different, but it's going to have the same people. Right now, there are 7,000 families on the wait list for affordable housing with the Tampa Housing Authority. That's just one reason why I'm making housing affordability one of my priorities for transforming Tampa's tomorrow. When we invest back into dynamic neighborhoods like West River, and provide opportunities for safe and attainable housing, we continue to shape this area into a top destination for all residents to live, work, and play.
The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. And Happy New Year to everybody. Welcome to 2023. We do not have anyone for invocation today, so can we please rise for a moment of silence? Thank you. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Roll call. Carlson. <coughs> Vieira. Oh, here. Maniscalco. Here. Hurtet. Here. Goobs. Here. Miranda. Here. And Citra. Here. We have a physical form. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shelby. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of council. Happy New Year. Martin Shelby, city council attorney. With regard to the um, communications media technology and the fact that this can be seen um, virtually and participation virtually and in person, what I would ask council to do is to waive your rules to make this consistent with so the instructions that are in the agenda and on the city council's webpage at tampa.gov forward slash city council. Thank you. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. I will entertain a motion for the adoption of the minutes from our last meeting. Second. Sorry. Mr. Shelby. Oh, I to interrupt, sir, but I just want to remind Council that you have two minutes to adopt. The minutes of the evening session are also included. So it's the regular session and then the evening session. So moved. Second. Second. For both sides. We have a motion made by Councilman Mascaco, seconded by Councilman uh, uh, Vera. All in favor? Is there any opposed? Thank you. Okay, let's go through the approval of the agenda. Do we have representatives from FDO? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Mr. Real Mr. quickly, um, relative to the agenda, um, uh, Morris Massey Legal Department, Item 56 is a budget resolution. That needs to be moved to January 19th because you all need to hear and take action as a CRA board before the money is moved by, uh, by U.S. City Council. That, so we would ask that item 56 be, be continued until uh, January 19th. Okay. Move to continue item 56. January 19th, 2023, yes. A motion made by Councilman Maniscalco seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. I do believe that there is item 62 that is being asked to be pulled by staff, and that will be heard at agenda item number two. So moved. Second. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Uh, Shelby. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Council, just a reminder with regards to item 80 through 84, those are the five ordinances for second reading for the charter uh, amendments. That is to have those items placed on the ballot in March. Um, there is a deadline for getting those items to the uh, supervisor of elections if that is what uh, Council's pleasure is, and uh, that is um, uh, presented to the mayor for her consideration. So that being the case, Council, I just want to ask you, these could be heard any time after 9.30 a.m., and time, frankly, is of the essence at this point in time. So the, uh, the time clock is running, so I would ask Council to consider taking them up early so that the uh, chair can work with the clerk to expedite so these, to have these, well, I haven't finished. So I need a motion, if, if, or whatever council's pleasure is, frankly. But what I'm asking council is that, that the items be taken up before lunch, so I, let me finish my thought on this, so that what can happen is the chair can then work with the clerk to expedite getting this matter onto the mayor's desk for her consideration. So move this, Joe. Yeah, 
I'll add that we could put it as item three. Yeah. So, so yeah, move it up. And yeah, it'll be done. nine. It'll be nine thirty. Yeah. Then, so. Yeah. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Thank we you. We are still in the cons agent agenda consent. Chair, do you want to review the staff reports? That's what I'm looking for right now. Thank you, sir. I believe let's let's go with uh, agenda item number three. That's a resolution. Uh, agenda item number four. Pardon? I'm sorry. No, they haven't. We haven't. That's what we're going through now. So the question then, Mr. Chairman, is staff needed for number three? No, I'm good. We good? Yep. Everyone good? Yep. No, I think, I mean, I, I think, uh, Mr. Beard, I mean, with these contracts here, these dollar amounts, he needs to at least let the public know what they've done with them, with those EBO numbers. That's very important. That's fine. Uh, and I think he can do it all, you know, under three with four or five. I think he can be able to get that done. Six. And six. All right. So we're keeping all of them? Yep. Okay. Number seven? Yep. Number eight? Uh, that's me. Um. <laughs> So we came up, and I, and I see Chief Tripp here, and uh, 754 is here as well um, for this with a compromise, I believe, where the overall issue on the report of the Public Safety Master Plan will be continued until February 23rd of 2023. But today, Chief Tripp and 754 will be here to, here to speak on New and North Tampa, as well as the status of the Public Safety Master Plan, not the report of it. That can be discussed, um, but that's the uh, my... Uh, Chief, I don't know if, if is that. Chief Tripp, are you, are you good with the, uh, giving the report on, uh, on District 7 and then talking about the status yep. of the overall report? Thank you very much. Okay, good. I, yes. So if I, may I make a motion for um, the report on the overall public safety master plan? Again, it will be discussed today, but the actual reporting will be done, if I may, on February 23rd, I think it said here, uh, uh, February 2nd of uh, 2023. Oh, no, sorry, so February 23rd, sorry, so of 2023. We have a motion made by Councilman Vieira, second by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Agenda item number nine is being asked to be removed. Second, yes. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman <coughs> Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Agenda item number 10, Councilman Vieira, that's yours? Uh, yes, I mean, we can, I mean, I'm... Glad to see this go through, obviously, but we don't need a report or, or anything on it. We can just move forward. Second. The motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman uh, Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And same for 11, sir. Same for 11. Motion made by Councilman Aye. Vieira, seconded by? Second. By Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Agenda item number 12, that is Councilman Goods. Yes, sir, I want to hear that, that report. Yes, Thank sir. you very much. <laughs> Number 13, that is being asked to be moved until June 22nd, 2023. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, agenda number 14, Councilman Hurtak. Um, I'm, I'm fine with the report and seeing how it's being used, unless any uh, other members have questions. No, I'm good. Okay. Second. We have a motion made by Councilwoman Hurtak, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Agenda item number 15. Yes, uh, 15, yes, yes. 
You want to hear 15? 15 and 16. I think we can get them both combined at the same time. I believe Fantastic. 15 has been accommodated. Yep. Mary told me something about it, but yep. I'm not sure, but I'm fine with you what you're saying. Okay. Agenda item number 17. Yes, please. If I, Mr. Bide is here. He did brief me on it, and there is a memo, but if you could just bri speak briefly on it, because we've had quite a few people reach out to me regarding Trader Joe's. Uh, also made the news again today, so I'd like to hear that. Thank you. Okay. Then we have gone through the consent agenda items. Move to approve the agenda. Second. We have a motion to approve the agenda by Councilman Mascot, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Do we have FDOT here with us? Agenda item number one is a 10 minute update from the Florida Department of Transportation to the City Council on projects within the City of Tampa. Morning Chair, Morning Council, Happy New Year. Uh, as requested by the Chair uh, and Councilman Carlson over two years ago, we have a quarterly update by FDOT today. Uh, we continue to work with FDOT District 7 and Secretary Gwynn to improve safety on our roadways and mobility for all modes. To that end, District 7 has done great work and they're here to report on some of uh, their projects in very critical areas within the city, but also how their approach has changed as we work together on Vision Zero. So at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, a friend and uh, colleague, Peter Shu, who is the safety person at District 7, accompanied by uh, uh, Eric. And uh, do we have Alex here? No. Great. Well, if Eric looks familiar, because it's because he is Alex, who is our Vision Zero coordinator, his husband, uh, brother. I'm sorry. Peter, take it away before I get us in trouble. <laughs> Good morning, Chair. Good morning, City Council. Good, good morning, City Councilman, Council uh, Woman. First thing, Peter Chu, I will give you uh, uh, education and encouragement back. So, because that's a part of our presentation to you about uh, what's going on happening in City of Tampa. Congratulations to City of Tampa. Do you know, based on the latest uh, fatal crash data tracked by DOT, uh, the fatal crash crashes happened in 2022 compared with 2021. Your city is making the dramatic impact. 22% reduction dropped from 76 to 59. This is an amazing result. I really, uh, this is just purely, we seen inside city of Tampa. But later I just want to say, how do we do it? Similar like uh, what echo what uh, Vic said, we have a great teamwork with your city. For example, recently I'm funding, using the federal safety fund, funding a bra two brand new signal with your city, more than a million dollars. But I'm going to ask my partner, Eric, and to really let you know the big picture about what we have done. And the goodie bag you have is part of the, the way we outreach to address traffic safety. Eric, all yours. Thank you, Peter. As Peter mentioned, my name is Eric Henry, related to Alex Henry, who you may know. Uh, I work out of our safety office. We were asked today to talk about a safety focused project from 2022. So we're gonna focus on a project along Nebraska Avenue that was programmed to improve pedestrian safety along that corridor. So to talk about that, we wanna give a little bit of background, talk about the Heights Mobility Study, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but just for some background, it started around 2017. The goal was to provide safety and mobility improvements for Tampa Heights, Seminole Heights neighborhoods. You can see the project limits there, it's sort of Hillsborough River to the west, Nebraska Avenue to the east, it was involved in coordination between FDOT, City of Tampa, Hart, Hillsborough MPO. There were walking audits done, uh, field reviews, community outreach with community members to determine what they thought uh, were necessary improvements in the area. And at the culmination of the project, there were a series of short-term and long-term suggestions that were provided for several corridors throughout the study area. Looking at those results, as well as some done by independent safety studies done internally, 
we identified a number of safety improvements that could be made specifically along Nebraska Avenue. And so in 2021, we programmed this project. You can see the limits there. It's Kennedy Boulevard to the south and all the way up to East Arctic to the north, providing several different kinds of pedestrian improvements, including raised medians, uh, mid-block crosswalks, including rectangular rapid flashing beacons or RFBs, pedestrian hybrid beacons, new sidewalk connections, plus more. All in all, over $3.4 million in design, construction, and CEI programmed in this project. It is set to let in June, so construction should begin sometime in fall of this year. So just to dive into some of the improvements that are going to be made and talk about the benefit that that will provide to pedestrians in the area. There's going to be a total of 27 raised medians installed along the corridor. You can see the design for just a few of them there. These will provide additional refuge for crossing pedestrians and provide an opportunity for uh, landscaping, future landscaping projects, so adding greenery, which can also help to slow traffic as an added benefit. There is going to be a total of six mid-block crosswalks installed. Three of them are going to be rectangular rapid flashing beacon crosswalks, or RRFBs. These will be at East 11th Avenue, East Bryan Street, and East 25th Avenue. Um, I'm sure you've seen these around. They look like that guy on the top there. It's a rectangular beacon, flashes rapidly. It lets drivers know there's a crosswalk here, there's pedestrians crossing, you need to stop, you need to yield. And they have been shown to drastically increase the rate of yielding pedestrians. And FHWA study found that they reduced pedestrian crashes by up to 47%. So that'll be a significant benefit for pedestrians in this area. The other three crosswalks at East Idlewild, Juno Street, and Seward Street will be pedestrian hybrid beacon crossings. You can see the designs for these three here. If you're not familiar with pedestrian hybrid beacon, they're sometimes called a hawk. They are a form of traffic control and a warning that warns drivers that there is a crosswalk here. Um, they will begin as a blank signal like this. A pedestrian will press the button to activate it. It will begin flashing yellow to warn drivers they need to come to a stop soon before proceeding to a solid yellow, solid red. Drivers come to a full stop and pedestrians are given the okay to cross. As pedestrians begin clearing the crosswalk, it'll begin giving them that red wigwag that lets them know they can proceed with caution as long as the crosswalk is clear before finally returning to a clear signal. Pedestrians aren't crossing, traffic's proceeding as normal. And again, these have been shown to be a massive benefit to pedestrians in places where they are installed. They've shown a reduction in pedestrian crashes of 69% and overall crashes of 29%. So again, a significant benefit to pedestrians in that area. But this is just one engineering project, and we don't want to give the impression that that is the only way that we try to approach safety. We try to come at it through the viewpoint of five E's, so engineering, yes, but also education, enforcement, evaluation, as well as encouragement. Uh, education is things like our safety PSAs, our teen traffic safety education program, our outreach to communities. Enforcement, we work very closely with local law enforcement. We have our ELEE program, which I'll talk about in a moment. Engineering, in addition to the project that I just mentioned, we have LED lighting improvements, high friction surface treatment, leading pedestrian intervals. On the evaluation side, that's something that's very important to evaluate these treatments and make sure that we're not just putting them out there and forgetting about them. And encouragement, which is largely internal, but also includes people like Peter Shu, our safety champions who kind of light a fire under people and get them excited about safety. So just to give a few examples of some of these and talk a little bit about some of the other efforts that we undergo, underwent in 2022. On the evaluation side and kind of the engineering side as well, we installed a series of turning radii improvements along Fowler Avenue. We call them tight rate turn lanes. You can see the traditional design on the left and then the new tight design on the right. These are designed to encourage drivers to turn at a slower speed, increase the rate of yielding to crossing pedestrians, increase visibility to pedestrians who are crossing with vehicles who are turning. We had the Center for Urban Transportation Research, Cutter at USF, perform before and after evaluation of this treatment and they found a reduction in right turn speed by 9.5% on average and an increased rate of yielding to pedestrians by 7%, uh, which when you look at it in nighttime only conditions, that was a 32% increase in the rate of yielding to pedestrians, so quite significant. But evaluation is important to us because we don't want to just put these treatments out there and hope that they are working. We want to check back in and see, is this working? If not, what, why? What can be done to change it? If so, good. How can we duplicate it going forward? On the education side, 
we began airing some of our safety PSAs during the previews in several movie theaters across the district in 2022. We began with a pilot over 4th of July weekend where we were able to reach over 200,000 people, movie theaters in the district, with some safety PSAs that were designed by Brandon High School students, actually. And we just recently wrapped up our second campaign, which went over Thanksgiving and Christmas, which we're still waiting for the final numbers on, but we know over Thanksgiving we were able to reach almost 300,000 people. So the final numbers are expected to be even greater. So this is just an innovative new way that we're trying to reach people with our safety messaging, especially people who may traditionally be harder to reach through our more traditional avenues of advertising. Finally, on the enforcement side, we had our Enhanced Law Enforcement Engagement Program, or ELEE program. This ran from February to August of this year. Essentially, this allowed local law enforcement agencies to donate enforcement hours in exchange for incentive points, which could then be exchanged for certain incentive items like speed radars, speed feedback trailers, things of that nature. We saw great participation in this program with 22 participating agencies in all five counties. And at the end of the program, we wound up with over 11,000 hours of enforcement donated, specifically along high crash corridors, so the areas where these enforcement hours are needed most. So with that, I want to thank you all for your time and open up the floor for any questions you have for me or Peter. Councilman Maniscalco. <clears throat> thank you very much for the uh, update and presentation. And I'm glad to see that you started off with saying the reduction. I think you mentioned 22% from last year to now. Um, because not so long ago, we were the most dangerous or one of the most dangerous for bicyclists and pedestrians in the entire country. On top of our high insurance rates because of so much insurance fraud and, and all sorts of stuff uh, that affect us. But uh, I had the opportunity when, when, you know, in the time of COVID in March 2020, when we were all at home, I wanted to get out of the house and I would walk uh, through the city. Uh, mainly from West Tampa to downtown to the airport, whatever it was, just to to see, you know, if I had to uh, if I had to walk to work every day, if I wasn't taking the bus, or if I were a bicyclist, what would it be like? And you know, each each street is different, each intersection is different. We've seen some improvements, and then we've seen the lack thereof. But um, if you look at other parts of the country. Uh, or other parts of, uh, throughout Europe, you know, how they focus on the pedestrian first. They p focus on different uh, techno technological methods. For example, the flashing crosswalks. I think those are effective. Um, Bayshore Boulevard, several years ago, we had a horrible, horrible, horrible tragedy uh, where a mother and, and child were killed. Uh, in that, uh, we saw some improvements with the reducing of the speed limit, with the installation of crosswalks, many of that are flashing. I use that area all the time, and I see people that, that benefit from it and people that just go right through these lights. We see it on Palm Avenue in Ybor City where they installed the flashing crosswalks. I can go on and on and on, but we've, unfortunately, due to significant death and significant tragedy, we've made improvements, and we still have a long way to go where people feel safe. You know, I walk, when I said I walked through the city in the time of COVID, there was very little traffic, but imagine a regular day. Uh, and crossing a busy street, crossing Dale Mabry, people that ride their bikes across Dale Mabry. I mean, that's such a wide stretch of road. Kennedy Boulevard, uh, Columbus Drive, Hillsborough Avenue. Um, I mean, so many, so many places for improvement, but we're taking those steps. You showed um, Nebraska Avenue, which is uh, just like Florida Avenue, which improvements have been made south of Hillsborough and whatnot. Uh, Nebraska Avenue, much needed uh, necessary improvements. Uh, again, you know, we have to think about people first. Bicyclists first. Not everybody can afford to drive a car. Again, it's very expensive. Insurance rates, gas, everything. We have to protect the pedestrians in this community. And I know that as we embrace Vision Zero, uh, as we embrace these policies, uh, I've sat on the uh, TPO slash former MPO for almost eight years, uh, and I've seen the improvements that we've made, but we have a long way to go. But again, thank you for the presentation, all three of you, because Vic, Everybody from FDOT, you're wonderful, you understand, and uh, just know that, that you have my support, uh, again, in keeping people safe, but you know, little by little, we're taking those steps, so thank you very much. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtag. Um, I just, I wanna say thank you so much for this presentation, um, especially the focus on Nebraska Avenue, which is a heavily, heavily pedestrian corridor. 
Um, people are crossing at any spot. So I noticed particularly the intersections that you've chosen are certainly areas that I also see when I traverse Nebraska Avenue, um, whether it be on a car or in a car or on a bicycle. So um, I'm hoping that helps slow some things down. Uh, I, the community is going to be very excited about this. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to seeing them go in to um, actual work. When do you think, if they're starting in the fall of 2023, that we'll start seeing some of these? Okay, come? that is, will be led in June. Usual construction mobilized, it will start from summer. This kind of project usually will take a, week, uh, a year. So sometime summer 2024. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Councilman Miranda. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, again, like uh, Councilmember Hertag just spoke about, the simple, people in similar heights have been under a lot of strain. Mm -hmm. Uh, it comes through the help that they've received and revitalized our area. Uh, many years ago, it wasn't even close to what it is today. However, with that closeness comes a lot of new businesses, thank God, small businesses, and a lot of more traffic. So what you're doing there is to save lives, and no one can save lives other than the driver of a car and the pedestrian. Sometimes both of them are at fault. Sometimes one doesn't look, sometimes the other one doesn't look, most of the times, neither one of them looks. So everybody's got a mindset of where they're going, how to get there, and what time the clock tells you you have to be there to arrive for whatever reason. And that's what society is about now, unfortunately. And, but thank you for what you're doing to slowing the traffic. I see the right lane turn now has been narrow. Instead of having an island, you have a, a longer dash. So somebody designed the island. It wasn't you, I don't think. But thank you for changing. Uh, life is a cycle of changes. And when you folks first started about talking about a exit off of the malfunction junction into Ybor City, I uh, immediately, I hate to say this, I told myself, some big people want the change. And I'm not gonna ask you who. But all that is now predicated on something else being built somewhere else in Ybor City. But I still think that that 20th Street, 21st Street exit is paramount Ebor City has a lot of traffic coming in and out, and you're, you're going to close that one, as I understand. Am I correct or not? Uh, it's going to remain open. Oh, well, good, because I, for a long time I'd heard that, that that one was going to be closed, and that would have been chaotic. Anytime you get on the expressway, especially at 3.30 in the afternoon, heading east, you're not going to get far. From 3.30 to 5.45, you're being gridlocked. You're lucky if you're going five, 10 miles an hour, which is great. I don't want people going 100 miles an hour when there's 10 million cars on the expressway. Talking about the expressway, every time we have an expansion of the expressway, not only does it dissolve part of the fiber of the neighborhood, but within a year, it's already antiquated. So I don't have an answer to that. I hope you folks have an answer for that. We do not have a very good transportation system to move around the city. Uh, certainly buses and things like that right now for whatever reason, maybe there's too big of a bus and too much time waiting on a bus. Maybe we need smaller buses and more rapid transit to move them around to start with. The streetcar certainly needs to be expanded, but we have to have other modes of transportation. The cars will eat you up if you don't because people want to get from point A to point B. Everybody's busy. Everybody's at they have a schedule to meet that is unbelievable. All of them do. So you folks, you the gentlemen right here in front of us that are the ones that are determined how further are we going to expand the expressway. I don't think you can make them any further because the more you do, the more you incentivize the same people that you want to get off the expressway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other council members? Thank you very much for this report. I just want to make the statement that I don't mean to keep bringing up something that happened, but the all for transportation should have gone through. The voters decided that. Because without the matching funds, the city of Tampa is nowhere. The city of Tampa is the transportation hub for West Central Florida. Land, sea, and air. Transportation should mean moving people, not vehicles. The city of Tampa cannot raise funds for transportation for public mass transportation. That is left up to Hillsborough County. 
Something is going to have to change in the future. We need to move people, not vehicles. Gentlemen, Happy New Year to you. Thank you for this report. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will be taking public comment. Anyone wishing to give public comment, if you would please form a line, my left, your right, and you will have three minutes to give your public comment. Ms. Burton, Happy New Year to you. Good morning, Happy New Year to all of you. Um, the all for transportation, just to jump on that, ain't going to ever go anywhere as long as the people that need it to vote, to push it, can't see economic benefit for themselves. That's number one. When I look at a 27-page agenda this morning and item three, four, five, six, big money, items moving, it don't say anything in there, the hiring, how do the African community benefit from all of these money projects? How? How do we benefit? How do it align itself with the resolution that you passed in 2020 that you stated that you recognized the ill effects of slavery and the, continual, the continuation of African people in this city being deprived of economic opportunities? So 27-page agenda, you're starting the year off. Hopefully, it don't continue. We must see an economic incentive for black people in this community so we can deal with some of the systemic problems. We are not going to be able to pray our way out of this, march our way out of violence. People have to have opportunities so we can move forward. Secondly, black lives matter. According to the Creative Loafing Report, that questionnaire that was sent out by the PBA should be denounced by all of you. The mayor should take a position on it. Most of the officers don't even live in the city of Tampa. But yet, they feel that they can uh, refer their point and their views to say, I would guess that if you participated in the black lives, or think that black lives have meaning in this city, then you wouldn't be worthy of their support. It's, it's racist, because you know what it didn't say? It didn't say that, uh, are you a member of the Proud Boards? What's your views about the Klan? What is your views about the ongoing systemic problems that black people are having in this country? It is racist, and they should be denounced. As we move forward to uh, dealing with the ongoing issues in our community, it is not enough that the naming of streets of honorable African people is enough. We need real change, and we are going to be concentrating, because what we see happening all across this country is the part two of the January 6th, and we see that it is trying to infuse itself way in Tampa, Florida, as well, by the initiation of the PBA. Thank you. Thank you. No, it is not. I want to say right quick about the transportation people. They gone. They out of here. But the fact of the matter is they building the straight up and down interstate so the homeless people can't sleep under the interstates. So they need to make a donation to the homeless population. That's what they need to put in their budget. But what we're going to talk about this morning is the Tampa Police Benevolent Association is a domestic military operation operating within the city of Tampa. It is nothing unique about it. All police unions nationwide are military operations operating with the domestic agenda for capitalism and imperialism. From 1990 and beyond, they're also operating in the interests of venture capitalists and neo-capitalists. All police unions in America is also the highest expression of white nationalism, Ku Klux Klan operation using taxpayers' money and taxpayers' resources. The Tampa PBA is nothing but a KKK operation operating right here in the city of Tampa with taxpayers' money, taxpayers' take-home cars, taxpayers' amenities, and other benefits not afforded to real poor and working class people, such as an 18% pay raise that no one asked for but was approved by city government. Each and every week, a motley crew, Abbott and Costello, three stooges crew of mermaids and puppets, try to tell the general population, the general public, about decorum 
and how to address the imperial hierarchy of the city of Tampa City Council. This group of clowns and jerks that can't even get to work on time, who can't understand hundreds of millions of dollars that comes before them within the course of a year, who can't stand up to a mayor, not just the current mayor, but any mayor, allows the PBA to forward to them a questionnaire or survey that is 100% offensive and illegal without any pushback or condemnation from the, their practices. The PBA is a Ku Klux Klan military operation that got to start like any other police department, which is from slave catching. Yes, the police department roots are deeply rooted in slave catching. It's the city council with all of its wisdom, decorum, and public service did not have the wisdom to forward the survey to the state attorney's office or the United States Department of Justice in a complaint form of a white nationalist organization sending suggestive or threatening letters in the form of a survey to public officials. If the survey isn't offensive to the mayor and the city council, it's offensive to the conscientious objections of the African community. It is offensive and insulting to the indignation of black people have had to suffer under the foot of Tampa Police Department and related agencies since 1855. It is offensive to the normal human beings. It should be offensive and painful to Jay Passmore, who was violently hit and ran over by crazed motorists operating an automobile in a criminal and reckless manner, but was not charged by the Tampa Police Department. It's offensive to people that's getting dragged by the police department. But the clowns have the nerve to do a litmus test on elected officials or potential elected officials feelings towards Black Lives Matter. I personally demand that anyone in possession of that white nationalist letter immediately call for the disbandment of the Tampa Police Benevolent Association and also forward the letter to the United States Justice Department for investigation. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Goods. Uh, you know, I don't, I love the place where I retired from, I, the good and the bad, because sometimes it was very bad, and sometimes they were very good. I received several calls in reference to the questionnaire for a lot of police officers that don't even know about the survey. The police department is, has a union, and they fight for the rights and the will of the workers for pay and wages and safety and so forth and so on. But a lot of officers did call me in concern about the survey because they did not know about the survey. All the sentiments aren't the same for all police officers. You know, uh, I, I filled out the questionnaire. I returned it back to the PBA. Some of the questions on there I thought were offensive. Uh, and I, in my responses, I let them know that I did feel offended by a couple of the questions that were indicated. If you're going to generalize, you need to generalize to everybody. So as a, as a black man, I, I was kind of offended with some of the questions. I, I'm prayerful that the, you know, sometimes we make mistakes when we do things. I've made them. We all make them. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the PBA will evaluate the survey and come out and maybe apologize to the community, uh, to the, uh, the candidates who are running for office, because some of the candidates were leery to fill it out because they were afraid they might not get an endorsement. Mm. But, you can't be afraid of that because you have to make sure you do the right thing at the right time. So I'm hoping that the PBA will take that back and uh, make a public apology of what was sent out uh, for everybody involved. Uh, most people know I'm not afraid to speak out. I don't care about retaliation or what have you. But, you know, as a black man, I, I have to speak out when it's right. And I, I know some other uh, high-ranking uh, police officials did call me last night as well. They had some concerns as well. Right is right, wrong is wrong, no matter how you may feel about protesters or what have you. As a police officer, I can remember Curtis Lane, my first protest, he led us to marching in, in, uh, over in Belmont Heights Estate. So I've been to protest. I've been in the fight. So I do understand both sides when, you know, police feel that the public is not standing up for them. I understand that sometimes. Uh, but police department is an unbiased entity, no matter what. No matter how you may feel about an individual person, your job is to protect and serve this community. And I'm just hopeful and prayerful that the PBA administration will, will look at it and see that the community is kind of outraged at what's happened and maybe retract it and do a public apology. Uh, that's my comments, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Reba Hyman. 
Nice to see you all, council members. Um, I'm here to speak on the Zion Cemetery. Tampa's first black cemetery and over 800 black pioneers were laid to rest over 100 years ago. After contributing to building this community due to blunt racism, greed, thievery, their rest was disturbed by white developers and business people who profit unjustly. Profit unjustly. You were not the city members at that time. The city permitted this to happen as early as in 1920. Council members, we need your help to restore justice to these people. We need the two private owners to cease their business operation and respect this land. Just like the land Housing Authority has done. You can use your intimate domain powers to take back this land so this cemetery can be respected as a final resting place for the black citizen once again. The Zion Cemetery Preservation and Maintenance Society Board, of which I am the vice president, needs your leadership to help make these private owners do the right thing. It's been three years since we discovered these bodies and nothing was never moved and still remained buried beneath these businesses. We need your help. Will you help us? With that being said, I'd like to set up a meeting with you all separately. I'd like to discuss this. You was given all folders of the information about Zion. If you don't know, now you can research it. This has been going on too long. Many other cities, states, have found these same type of cemeteries and making great movement and strive towards and correcting this. It wasn't you who caused it, but it's you who can make the change in the future here in Tampa. Tampa is a growing city. People are moving here like crazy. We set the pace for a lot of other cities and states. You have the authority to help Zion to help my people, to help the people that are buried there, to show some respect, to give back to the families in the need. And with that being said, I'd like to set up a meeting with each and every last one of you and some of the board members to discuss this a little bit further. Please, please, be a body of strength, make movement, make stride. We need your help today, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am, please. My legislative aide Tim is going to come out, and he will help coordinate a meeting with all of us individually. Okay, Councilman Maniscalco. No, you, you said it. We'll get your information, and we'll coordinate with all of our offices and and set up individual meetings. So, could you please just one more time state your name for the record? My name is Reva Iman. I am a resident here in the city of Tampa. I was actually stand in public housing in Rose Park when those bodies was found. So it is with great deed to me personal. Personal because I was a resident there. I watched this process and um and you don't have an extra copy for the clerk if you Yes I do. You do? Thank you so much. And ma'am, my legislative aide is a gentleman right there at the door. He'll help coordinate, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> uh, good morning, Council. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, there's a lot going on this morning. Uh, Robin Lockett. I came here wanting to talk about one thing, but there's a lot going on with this uh, questionnaire. <laughs> You know, I find it interesting that, uh, I'm gonna make a few comments about it. I would love to see what people would do when no one's watching. So all, and anybody would do, a lot of people would do a lot to get an endorsement from an agency when it's the people that they, can, they, they need the endorsement from. So they're relying upon selling your souls out on a questionnaire to get an endorsement. I, I wish this article would have came out later 
to see who signed it to see what they said. Because it could, it would have, hopefully it would have been made public. But anyhow, it's a lot going on, and I hope that you guys take it seriously. And it shouldn't just, it's not a black and white thing. It's a right thing. It's a right thing. Um, Reva talked about Zion. I lived in Robes Park, 212 East Kentucky. So where they have it roped off at, that grave site was right under our apartments. 212 East Kentucky. So I'm a, it's, it's amazing. I mean, we find out so much. I'm, I'm getting emotional now. We find out so much uh, that goes on, and it comes up later. All the hell that goes on through, uh, in Robles Park, all, just everything, and, and there's a cemetery there. Unsettled bodies, unsettled rest. Um, I've been getting phone calls uh, in regards to um, the, the R3 money. People still have applied for it. They're, they're being told that it's not, there's no more funds. So I've been ringing the bell for this for months, saying, what happens? This is a Band-Aid. We're feeding the, the developers, right? What happens when that money runs out? Incomes have not changed. Rent is still increasing. Been great if y'all had did the, the, uh, the rent stabilization, at least tried it for a year. But rent is still increasing, and people are still where they are. What happens when the money runs out? What happens when the money runs out? We cannot operate in fear. We cannot operate in fear when people are, 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 are suffering. What happens when the money runs out? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in chambers that wishes to speak to public comment? Okay, I believe we have Michael Randolph online. Michael, you there? Um, yes, I'm here. Thank you very much and uh, happy uh, New Year's and good morning. A new year and a new attitude. 2022 prepared us for the start of 2023, which is going to take us to the next level. Today, I want to speak to the silent majority who feel that they're left behind, who feel that no one has their back. Those who go to bed every night wondering if they're going to be priced out of the community or having fear. I also want to address the vulnerable population, from the citizens, the jobless, the fixed income, low income, those at risk that's hanging on the corner, the disabled, businesses threatened, threatened by crime, the homeless, those returning from uh, prison, victims of crime, and those who commit crime, those who are suffering from, more, from substance abuse and mental health. Last year, our project, which is going to start this year, is going to increase the quality of life of those people who feel that they left behind. Those projects include the West Tampa Technology, Wealth Building, and Job Creation Center, which is going to create 100 plus new businesses, home based businesses in the community. The West Tampa, the West Tampa Public Safety Initiative, which is going to address the issues of businesses in West Tampa that are leaving. The West Tampa Empowerment, I'm sorry, Engagement uh, Program, in which we've had seven community meetings last year. We plan to have four committee uh, meetings this year. The Rome Yard Partnership with the city, Tampa Housing Authority, and related groups, and the relationship with FedEx, that is the, um, what is this, Florida Department of Transportation, which is going to lead to hundreds of jobs for residents in West Tampa. This year, 2023, we want everybody to know we have your back. No one left behind in West Tampa. West Tampa will see our office open up this year to start receiving guests, as well as staff. Those who need a job right now, we're currently taking application for those who want to work with construction and the uh, Florida Department of Transportation. These are good jobs. Even if you have a criminal record, we can get you a job with a good pay. 
2023, we hope, is the year that we change the narrative to be the best that we can be. Again, for those people in West Tampa that go to bed every night, and I hear you on the phone that's concerned about whether or not you can be priced out of the community. Those who live in fear, we're changing the narrative. 2023 is going to be a year in which everybody benefits and no one is left to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Randolph. Ms. Strohmeyer, are you with us? Again, is there anyone else in chambers who would just make a public comment at this time? Thank you. According to a vote made by city council members, we at this time will be taking agenda items 79 through 84. No? Eighty-three, eighty-four. 84, excuse me. Was the administrative update was? I believe the motion was made that we will take those uh, uh, charter three. amendments first before. Isn't that what's made? I thought the motion was number three. Attention. 62, right, for the CRA? Correct, but I thought the motion was to take the, take, take the, the, the um, charter amendments as first. item number yes, three. Yes, that's, that's what the vote was made for. That was to make this it was, agenda item number two. I thought this was two, but okay. Yeah, okay. That's, that's what I had asked for, but Councilman Goods asked to make the motion for the charter amendments to be taken before that. Thank you very Me much. Me too. Thank you. Thank you. The first one we will be hearing motion to open, please. is 79. Is that correct, Mr. Shelby? Um, it would be 80. Would be. Then we will hear 80 first. Oh, Second. 80 through 84. We have a motion book. to open 930 hearings uh, uh, by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Agenda item number 80. Mr. Chairman, this is being presented for a second reading and adoption. Uh, this is uh, regarding uh, the um, uh, amendment to section 9.01. Uh, if uh, council wishes to proceed, then uh, to open it for public comment. <coughs> is there any public comment to agenda item number 80? Do we have anyone online? We have a motion closed by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. We will take a roll call vote on agenda item. I'm sorry. Uh, Councilman Carlson, can you read uh, agenda item number 80? Yes, sir. I'd like to move uh, file number E2022-8CH2, uh, ordinance being presented for second reading adoption ordinance relating to the government of the city of Tampa, Florida, submitting to the electors of the city a proposed amendment to the revised charter of the city of Tampa of 1975 as amended to amend section 9.01 to clarify that standing boards shall be created by city council by ordinance without requiring the mayor's recommendation providing effective date. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilwoman Hurtak. Roll call vote. Yes, Councilman Brando. I'm supportive based on the fact that not only this administration, the prior administration had set up a, an avenue to the public to have, in, in my opinion, the best of everything. That was setting individuals from the general public to sit in as the Charter Review Committee, some appointed by the mayor, some appointed by the council. That was not done this time. It was just the council members doing it on their own without the Charter Review. So therefore, I would be opposing most of these. Thank you very much. Roll call vote, please. Miranda? No. Her attack? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. And Citro? No. Motion carried with Miranda and Citro voting no. Agenda item number 81. Again, Council Martin, Shelby City Council Attorney. This is a, a um, an ordinance relating to um, uh, placing on the ballot uh, a uh, clarification um, as set forth 
uh, in section 6.03 relating to um, the mayor's nominations of the head of departments and other city employees. Yes, Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a question on this because I, I was looking at this and Ms. Travis, who's here, if I, if I may, uh, for, for Ms. Travis, if I may, um, I had voted no on this. It, originally, I voted no. It, it, it came up outside of the charter workshop. Then the next time you kind of spoke to it, can you just tell me? I mean, because when I read this, I, I, you know, call me whatever, but I, I don't see the significant burden in this. Tell me how this would burden your job, because I, 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 you know, take you uh, uh, very seriously, so to speak, as I take everyone, but particularly you. So go ahead. Good morning, Council. I'm Nicole Travis, Administrator of Development and Economic Opportunity, and Happy New Year. Yes, um, mm -hmm. The comments that I made regarding this charter change was regarding recruiting um, C-suite executives. If you, if you are hiring a person in a C-suite and their um, confirmation is in, in balance, is in the wind, chances are they won't leave a job mm -hmm. um, knowing that they have to be, they won't necessarily get this job. It is very, when you're in the public sector, once you put in an application, um, especially if you're in a comfortable, when I say comfortable, but in a, in a job that you like and the people like you and you're doing a great job, it is difficult to recruit for C-suite executives, top talent that mm -hmm. would have to um, wait until a confirmation, not knowing whether or not um, they would have the position. And the way that this is written, you, will, you can't appoint that person to the position. They would have to be in another position or in the wind. So essentially, I would have never mm -hmm. necessarily taken this job knowing that um, I was leaving a city that loved me and I loved it and mm -hmm. worked well, knowing that there's a chance that I may not get the votes. Yeah. Um, for this position. So it just makes it very difficult um, recruiting for top talent, um, especially at my level, C-suite executive directors and above. That's what I was saying. Thank you. And, and if I may ask for, for Mr. Shelby or, or anybody who can inquire on this issue, it, isn't, that, or isn't there already some sort of, of doubt whenever you go into a job, you're the interim uh, director of whatever it may be, then you're going to be subject to a city council confirmation anyway. So isn't that doubt already there? And doesn't this just further solidify council's role in this regard? In other words, I don't, uh, again, I'm, 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 and I should have had this question privately, and I apologize, council, for this. Um, but it, d does this significantly change what is in effect now? Ultimately, Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Ultimately, this has been in the charter in another form with regard to, <clears throat> and if you look at the ordinance, it uh, changes the concept of appointment to a nomination. And what happens is the nomination of the mayor is then submitted to City Council, who then does the appointment. And this came up, as you know, um, based on um, issues that came before council with regard to interpretation. And ultimately, what you have is the, uh, also the concept of the 2018 Charter Review Commission also added language to allow that if the council chose to deny that confirmation, the mayor then would have the opportunity to resubmit the same name. Um, what this does by this change is it clarifies uh, the process and also adds new language to create the concept or define the concept of making an interim appointment, whereas there have been times in the past where by the naming of an interim appointment actually allowed somebody to remain in that position mm -hmm. for a longer period than what this now says, that the mayor needs to act in a period of 90 days, and then that can be extended by the mayor for an additional 90 days. Mm -hmm. What this does, obviously, is based on Councilman Goode's um, suggestion based on Council's experience with regard of the process, and the intention is actually to clarify that which was mm -hmm. in the Charter, which was to give the City Council the say over yeah. department heads and greater. Yeah, So, and, and thank you for that. So, I mean, for, for me, I, we have four votes in favor of this. This could be vetoed by the Mayor. Um, I, I want to inquire more, and I should, and I apologize, I should have done this before. 
um, and whatnot. I, I want to speak to staff more on this. This appears to pass. It's going to go to the next level. Um, it, if it is, in fact, vetoed by the mayor, I may switch my vote on it. I may do that. Um, but I want to inquire with more people on it. I don't, I don't want to jump back and forth. I, I just, that's just not my style. But um, this is going to pass today, but I do want to talk further on it if it comes back to us. So thank you. Councilman Hurtak. So the last time we brought this up, it was a little more abstract. And it was based on what had happened with the police chief. And guess what? We're here again. And so what I'm hearing from the public is very clear that they don't want that to happen again. And that's what this does. This prevents that from happening again. The public is demanding to be a part of the next police chief choice. They're, they're demanding it. That's all I hear. I had a nice long conversation with someone about it yesterday. So I am wholeheartedly supporting this for that reason alone. Because ultimately, while I understand Ms. Travis's concern, we could have someone that starts a job and all of us could say, nah, I don't think so. And then that person's stuck. So I, I do not think that just plopping someone into a job and then making us say, oh, well, they've already moved here and they've done, that, I, I feel that's coercion and I don't, I don't wanna do that. I'm, I want to absolutely approve someone for the, the work they've done. And you know what, rarely is it an issue because I trust our staff, they, for the most part, I mean, I, I cannot imagine a time where, where generally um, department heads aren't brought to us with a, a stellar resume, good recommendations, the chance for us to actually talk to them ahead of time. This is coming up because of what just happened with the police chief. And I'm gonna hope that this time we'll all have a chance to talk to that person before they're nominated. We'll all have a chance to make sure the public has. And that, in my opinion, and I can't speak, for um, Mr. Goods, but for me, that's what this is doing. Councilman Goods. It's just common sense. There was a flaw. It, it, the system was in place, but when you have a situation that arises and you're stuck, you need to fix the process. The process was flawed. If this council wanted to deny someone Mr. Mascalco was just swing vote because he felt, you know, you, you can, it's going to go on and on and on and on and on. So to say that you won't fix a process that's broken is asinine to me. I respect Ms. Travis tremendously. She knows I do. But when you apply for a job in hopes of getting a job, there's a process to getting a job. So a mere fact that you you know, no one's just going to leave their job and don't get a job. I, I, I can't imagine that. Most people, when they get, say they got the job, they, 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 they take the job. But for me, it's the process. The process is flawed and the verbiage is wrong. To nominate someone, we appoint that person. After that, it's the mayor's baby, whoever is, what, da, da, da. But it's our job to listen to the community, to listen to the people. It's our job. That's why you have to nominate. That's why I always say, how come I didn't get a chance to meet this person? To hear their background, let me, let me feel this person out. From day one, I said, how come I don't get to talk? How come we just bring people before us and we just going to appoint some people? That's wrong. It's totally wrong. And I can't sit back and just support things that are wrong. I, I want to fix things to make them right for the administration, not because of a strong form of American government, but because it's the right thing to do. I will be supporting it. That's why I put it up. And we know the chaos we went through when we had a flawed system. And we cannot be afraid politically or whatever not to fix things. This is what this council is supposed to do. We are the governing body of the city. It's our job to make sure that the house functions properly, regardless who likes it, who does it, but make sure the rules are put in place. And I'm sorry, rules have to be in place, and we have to understand the interpretation of the rules. And for me, the rules that were put in place, the interpretation was off. We could do nothing about it. But here we have a chance to fix the interpretation and the rule. Councilman Manitskaka. Thank you very much. You know, 
at the federal level, the president has their nominee for a Supreme Court justice, and there's a lengthy process. This is obviously on the grander scale, or even a cabinet member. A cabinet member has to be approved. Um, and those people, those are life-changing things where they're moving to a different area, serving in a different capacity, but I don't see any harm or foul. And in my recollection, in the time that I've been here, it was only controversial once. So it's not like, oh, we've had contentious votes for approval of department heads. It was only once. And I heard a lot from the public regarding that issue. Uh, and as Councilmember Goods mentioned, I was a swing vote, meaning I got even more heat with it. But however, I think about if I were on the other side, in that other person's shoes, you know, would it affect me? No, because I would nominate the best and the brightest individual for that position where I wouldn't even have to worry. If that person has such a stellar resume, then what's the worry? Again, it's only been controversial one time. Um, I just don't. I don't see this strong arming or tying the hands of the mayor or, again, if I were in that position, I would say it's a checks and balances system. And again, we took a lot of public comment uh, and a lot of public opinion in regarding to a more recent situation, and I don't see any harm or foul in this. So that's it. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. Yes. Um, to follow on what Councilmember Good says, all this is doing is fixing the misinterpretations of this part of the charter in the past. It doesn't change uh, the the main thrust of the of what the charter said before, and that a mayor can never appoint somebody without city council approval. And I don't know of any cases. Uh, Councilmember Miranda has been here a lot longer than I have, but I don't know of any cases where city council didn't approve someone. In the one case where it was controversial, since I've been on council, we maybe should have pushed a little bit more. The mayor certainly should have listened to the public and, and not push that through uh, with a political fight. Um, but uh, what's happened, is, and, <clears throat> and uh, Marty mentioned the case from uh, several years ago, the last mayor misinterpreted the charter and illegally allowed a very, very good person to stay longer um, uh, because of a misinterpretation of the charter and leaving the word interim. And we tried to fix it in the Charter Review Commission. It didn't quite fix it. And so now we're trying to finish in this, in this way. The mayor's people are going around saying on these and also the ones that we proposed before that didn't get passed that we're trying to take away the strong mayor form of government. That's just political BS. It is what's happening is we're trying to do the reverse. And I want to make it clear to anybody who's listening. We're trying to do the reverse. We're trying to fix the misinterpretations of uh, that prior mayors and city attorneys have misinterpreted the charter to take power away from city council. And what we're trying to do is restore that power so that we can have uh, checks and balances. We need to make it clear that this, whoever a mayor appoints has to be approved by city council. And, it, and the only reason why we're doing this is because of the misinterpretations. Um, what happened this last time, it was not only controversial in the approval, but, but in the interim phase, <clears throat> the mayor called the person by the permanent title. And that really offended people in the public and it was very disrespectful to city council. And whatever you think about this city council, you should believe in American democracy and American democracy is about a balance of powers. And a balance of powers has checks and balances and we are, and we are uh, voted in to be that check um, against a mayor. It's not the, our choice, it's the charter's choice and it's a Amer basic American democracy. And so if this is vetoed for whatever reason, that's a vote against democracy and checks and balances. Um, uh, I will say also that um, the, uh, just to remind everybody, the charter always had the right for city council to change the charter. That was always in the charter. The Charter Review Commission was set up ad hoc by the last city council. Uh, I think three of my colleagues were on the board then, and thanks to them for setting up because several of us were on that board. But we as a Charter Review Commission and that city council voted and then the voters ultimately decided to put the Charter Review in the, in the Charter. That was not in there before five years ago. That was something new. That, uh, since probably going back to 1975, the city council always had the right to review the Charter. So it's not that we're breaking the process. That's another message coming out of the mayor's office. We're not breaking the process. We're just not following the new process, but the old process is still in there. So let's not split straws on this. Let's just be honest with the public Let's tell the public that we believe in checks and balances, we believe in American democracy, and we believe in correct and accurate interpretations of the law. There's something on here we're going to be fixing today that potentially could have cost the city hundreds of millions of dollars that we're fixing because of a misinterpretation by a prior city attorney. 
We need to make sure that this city follows the law, and the law is voted on by the public, and it's called the charter. It's the Constitution of the city. Thank you. Councilman Moran, I, 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 I've listened to uh, some very good factual things. I just want to make sure that uh, these things do not take, uh, I like a strong mayor form of government, and I like a check and balance from the council, always have, and it's always worked for as long as I can remember. This was one of four, we have four items here, I think there was 20 some items that were presented. And it was just alluded to that the Charter Review Commission that we formed up with cooperation from the mayor's office at that time and the city council members, and some of us were here and it was another mayor, worked. This has never been vetted by anyone other than the council members. That's not the way the process was set. It was set that we had a Charter Review Committee we took everything, they took it, and there's four of us in this room that serve on that committee. Three are now city council member, and one now is a city attorney. So it does work. However, we did not abide by the same rules that we set in the beginning, which was the Charter Review Committee would have it and vet it out, come back to us, just like we do with other things. The CRA is another one. We don't sit as a, we sit as a CRA, but they do the work and they see what they want in their community and they bring it up for a vote with us. And these are the things that when you talk about transparency, when you talk about the legalities of things, it's not done the same way now. So what does the general public want to think? It was invented by no one in the community, none that sat on that side as we did years back. I don't know what they're going to think. But I've heard that, those words very, very many times. And it was never vetted by anyone other than seven council members. That's not the way the process was set up. So the process is the one that I'm sticking with. And I'm not opposed to this item. I'm opposed to the process in which has gotten to us without a vote from no one. Not the public, not no one. Like having a zoning hearing with no public participation. That's exactly what this is. In another form so you can understand what I'm trying to say. So when these things happen, where's this transparency? Where's the public input? I don't see it anywhere, do you? That's a question I'm asking myself. So that's why sometimes I have to think back and say, what actually happened five or six, seven years ago? How did it happen? It took over a year from that, if, it, if I recall, about a year for that committee sends a review, spending their time trying to make the city better. And they did. However, in this new process, they've been zeroed out. We don't need you anymore. We've used you once, that was enough. And I believe that there's where the fault is. Not in us, not in the public, but in the process in which we've come to this point today. So these are the things that I'm bothered with, I'm troubled with. Some of these things are fine. I agree with them. But procedurally, how can I vote for something that I know that was flawed from the beginning? Those are the things that I'm concerned with. The process was not followed, how they originated everything that's happening today through public participation from the members of the review, Charter Review Committee. And I'm, I'm troubled by that, and uh, I don't know what else to tell you. Thank you. Councilor Um If I'm correct, once we close this, don't we open this for public comment? Yes, we do. We have to open it for public comment before we close. Well, I'm just saying it's, uh, I, I believe that's how the public is involved. So just going to say that. And Mr. Chairman, if I can just clarify for the council and the public, um, the Charter Review Commission made recommendations to city council. Um, this, the Charter Review Commission, as it was set up, did not directly have access to place things on the ballot. It was ultimately, by ordinance, city council's decision of what to accept. Coincidentally, or through the work of the Charter Review Commission, the city council accepted every one of the recommendations. And one of the recommendations was to create the process for periodic review of the, ch of the charter 
in addition to being able to do it by ordinance by the city council. Because even up until today, ultimately everything has been done by ordinance of city council. It is ultimately um, where the buck stopped, is where the city council chose to put something on the ballot. And every charter amendment that's been placed before the voters has been done um, pursuant to ordinance and charter and state law to be able to place things on the ballot. So that being said, this, this provision has been there for, um, I believe, from the beginning. I don't know the full history, but it certainly um, uh, hasn't, um, hasn't changed but for the um, uh, changes in 2019 um, by the voters. Um, the question that I want to bring to Council's attention at this point, and I raised this earlier, is the concept of the veto. And without getting into a long discussion about it, I shall say that Section 2.10 of the veto says that if any ordinance shall not be returned to the Council within 14 days after it is presented to the Mayor, the same shall become effective in like manner as if he or she had signed it. That would be the case, but for the fact that there is a shot clock running, and we talked about this um, early on, from the deadline that is necessary by the supervisor of elections to get these items placed on the ballot. Ideally, this should go if they are signed by the mayor or even overridden by the veto, uh, by, uh, or overridden, uh, the veto overridden by city council. The date would be ideal would be the 13th of January. That's how soon we are from having to do this. We have up until the 20th, but then we have to then provide it with Spanish translation, which has not been done in the past. Normally that's done by the supervisor of elections, but they need an additional week by the deadline of January 20th to get that done. Council's next meeting date is the 19th of January which is a day before the deadline. So in effect, what happens is that if the clock runs out to get these to the supervisor of elections by the deadline, then the voters won't have a say in March. And that's just the reality of the way this is scheduled, the way this has come forth, the way this has been structured. So I just want to bring that to council's attention. That's why it's, in, in my opinion, important to at least get this on the mayor's desk as soon as possible so the mayor can make whatever action uh, she deems necessary, that's her prerogative, and then we can move forward from there. But in effect, what happens is that if that deadline is missed, the practical effect is that the voters will not get the opportunity to have a say in March. Mr. Chairman? Councilman Goods. You know, I, I respect my colleague, Mr. Miranda. He's the wizard. He's been here forever. He knows. But the problem I have uh, is that the, the, we did hear from the voters. We, we heard them for a long time. It reference to this issue 81. And then when I look at all the proposed charter amendments to go to the voters, and I look at who voted before, I look at 82, 83, 84, and I see unanimous. So I'm, I'm kind of confused of, of, of what we're saying that the, the, the process is flawed, but I see unanimous on, on three out of the six of them. So I, I would just say that we have heard from the voters. That's why we're here. And again, I just think we go ahead and move the process. Let's take the vote. And let's move on to get it to the mayor's office and then let the process go how it needs to go. I, I'm, can I hold it until the city uh, council attorney gets back? Because he said five, five or six things went out on one item that went all the way around. And it was a little confusing to follow. You said I would prefer to have the city attorney, excuse me, no, our city council, council yeah, our fine. attorney back in the room. Before we finish discussion. Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shelby, not yes. at all. I'm not being critical of you or anything else, but when you started speaking on one item, you went to another item and another item and another item and another item. Oh, I'm sorry. And it was kind of, a, a, I don't know, hard to follow, I guess. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. So let me, let me just start by saying thank you for the work you do and how you do it. 
Uh, however, I have to disagree on a couple of item, minor things. You, the last item you spoke about was what about? The last item I spoke was about the, the timing of the clerk and uh, the city council and getting it on the ballot. Meeting the deadline by the supervisor of elections and Let the process. Let me remind you, you said that twice in the beginning of the meeting. Yes, I did. And now you said it again. Yes, sir. We follow that very clearly, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. I just wanted. Now, do you agree or disagree that that committee that was set on the, to revise the city charter should not have been brought up or should have been brought up on this vote? To clear the air, when we wanted to change the charter last time, we did set a process through the former mayor on council representation and mayoral presentation. Am I correct or not? Yes, sir. I, and I was actively involved in creating that uh, process. I'm glad you did. Yes, sir. And I appreciate the job you did. So then, when this charter, now this is a change of the same charter, am I correct or not? Yes, sir. It is. So then, did we follow the same process of which the public had the right of input from two governmental agencies, the council and the mayor, collectively working for the betterment of society and everyone who lives in the city of Tampa? Again, sir? The mayor and the city council set up a process so that all were encompassed in the Charter Review Committee that sat in meetings time and time again and voted many times to have a clarity on what they felt was best for the community of the city of Tampa. Am I correct or not? Yes, sir. City Council is what initiated that process. The City Council at the time because the Charter had not been comprehensively reviewed since the 1970s. And every amendment since the 1970s has been initiated by City Council and placed on the ballot after an ordinance approved by City Council. So then, sir, if that body has not been informed, you just said from the 70s, that we set up a process where we had a, a review individuals City attorney, three sitting council members were part of that, and it was a, a large number of people. I don't think it was that large, but large enough that we can get a cross section of every understanding of life in the city of Tampa. Those with, without, those of everything that was different, and I appreciate those that served. So then we're now having a review of the charter without the review by the citizens. Am I correct or not? Without following that process under what is now Section 1010 of the Charter, there's also Section 10-11 under the Charter Amendment, which states, the City Council may propose amendments by ordinance to this Charter. Upon adoption of the initiating ordinance, unless provided for otherwise in this Charter, the City Council shall submit the proposed amendments to a vote of the electors at the general election held within the City or a special election called for such purpose and it tells how it can be done. It can also be done initiation by petition. So, so the answer to your question is what happened in 2000 and, what was it, 18? 17. It started in 17. It began substantially sooner, excuse me, earlier, because it took, quite frankly, three chairs to be able to get through the process of creating that Charter Review Commission. And one of the most significant processes was the city council at the time, in order to make sure that that was properly funded to take place in the future, added, I believe it was $50,000 to the budget to allow that to happen. Because up until that point, there had not been a charter review commission at all. This, what had took place in 2017, was the first time in the history of the city that that ever took place. And that was put in place in the charter to create an alternative to section 10-11 saying that the city may propose amendments by ordinance to this charter, which is what the city council has done in this case. And, and when you were reading there, did I hear something may or may not? That I'm not, I don't have anything in front of me, so I'm just gonna have to go by memory what you said, sir, I'm sorry. There are two ways, there are two ways to be able to amend this charter presently. A charter review commission or for what Florida statutes also provides to be able to do it by ordinance. So we choose the one without the commission, is that what you're saying? Well, the, the commission- it's obvious that we did. You obviously did because at the time, it's now every commencing in 2027, which means that unless you did it by ordinance, you would not be able to amend this charter no. in any form or fashion, regardless of the reason. If you didn't invoke section 10.11, 
you would have to wait until 2027 and that process before Counselor, you'd be able to do it. Anything we do without ordinance, you can't do. You have to have an ordinance. That, that's a known fact. But you yourself admitted that we choose not to have the review. Am I correct? That's true. Answer yes or no, sir. Yes, I'm sir. just trying to find out where we're at. No, I, actually, I, 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 you raise a very good point, sir, and let me just read this for a minute. There is in section 10.10 .10 the fact that it does say the city council may by ordinance have the power to call for the establishment of a CRC more often in the event if it so chooses. So in that much. sense, you can call for it uh, wait, before waiting until 2027. So thank you, sir. I do thank you very much for being so kind and answering the questions. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, sir. Councilman Hurtak. Yeah. Councilman Carls. Yeah, the, the, the fact is that I, I don't know, the councilor can correct me, but I think since 1975, or at least a long time ago, city council has always had the right to propose amendments to the public, and the mayor had the right to veto or not veto. Um, we added, we, we, the Charter Review Commission, the city council at the time, and then the public added the Charter Review Commission as an additional thing. There are, when we started as the Charter Review Commission, uh, most of us ha knew nothing about the charter, very little about it. We had to be educated, which is why the process took so long. There are now four of us on city council, um, Goods, Hertek, Citro, me, plus three um, that were on the city council at the time. And then we have two city attorneys in the room who were on that board. I think there were nine on the board and six of us are in the room today. And so instead of relying on uh, people like us uh, who didn't have experience at the time. We now have six people who have experience. This has been drafted by outside council, but it's been reviewed by council and I assume by the two who served on, this, on the Charter Review Commission. So there's nothing wrong in the process. In fact, we're following the process that was always, always there. The only new process that we're not following is, is the option of having another Charter Review Commission. But I wanna say for the public, um, every time we've discussed these now, it's been five or six times over, the, over a long period of time, the public, and there were a lot of these that were rejected uh, by council, the public has had many, many opportunities to contact us to speak in public comment. They're gonna have an opportunity to speak in a few minutes. And I must say, over the 18 months or so, the Charter Review Commission, we only had two meetings where we had more than a couple people at the meetings. I think there's a reporter in the room who can confirm he was in the room. I think he was one of the two people who were there. Um, there, was, there were one or two meetings where people in the public got more than a handful of people to come. But we asked as a Charter Review Commission, the communication department of the former mayor to communicate the meetings so that we could get the public there and the communication department of the former mayor said no. And so then we asked again and they said no again. They refused to communicate it so that we could get the public there. And so that process was flawed as well and it did not include robust public and comment. This process does because people know and expect to come here um, every Thursday and they're giving us lots of feedback on it. In a minute they're gonna tell us whether they agree with this or not. But all, again, all this is is a clarification of the charter so that some future city attorney cannot misinterpret it as they have in the past. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Shelby. Mr. Chairman, just, just one comment. Um, that we are here today because of previous votes of city council, previous majority votes. I don't know exactly whether they, some were unanimous perhaps, perhaps not. But this has been following a process at the direction of city council. Um, this is city council's initiative from the beginning. Um, I was asked to make a, a running list of when things came up, when uh, Chairman Goods was, uh, excuse me, when Councilman Goods was sitting in the chair seat. And I did so at council's direction, at the chair's direction. Um, this is this process up until this day has been um, a result of votes, previous votes of city council. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention, uh, and just to let you know that um, ultimately it is city council's discretion in this case, subject to uh, the mayor's action as the charter um, provides, and uh, it is ultimately city council's decision um, how it wishes to move forward. Mr. Shelby, clear something up for me, please. Yes. You said either. Either way, it can be made by change, either through ordinance or through a charter amendment. No, sir. Um, the ordinance you could you could initiate a you could initiate a ballot question, but it has to be initiated by ordinance. It These changes we want to make can yes. be done through ordinance or through a charter change. No, it has to be ultimately an ordinance. Ultimately, it has to be by an ordinance. But an ordinance is what 
provides it being sent yes, to the I, voters. I, I, it is the voters who I'm make. Getting, I'm going to get another point, but please go ahead. It is the it is this this does not change the charter. Your passage today does not change the charter. Because what it, it does? It can't be vetoed by the mayor. It can be vetoed by the mayor. Thank you. If we were to just do an ordinance, city council doing an ordinance to, to affect these changes, the mayor couldn't veto that ordinance. No, sir. The mayor. The mayor always has. Then I'm. I, I, then we're. We're going. We're. we're go, it right. seems to me that we're going through a long process that may not get to that point when we can simply make an ordinance. No, sir. The only you just way, contradict what you said. No, then no. let me make it clear. The only way you, you cannot change your charter. This is the people's charter, and the people get. I'm not the people trying. Are given, no, I'm, 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 not, I'm not being. I'm not, forgive my passion, but it's not directed towards you or anybody personally. This is the people's charter. And I've been actively involved in this from the inception when city council wanted to be able to have a body to review this charter comprehensively, facilitate it. I was involved in the process of obtaining the facilitator. I was involved in crafting the and process. I, but I, let, the let's, let's, let, okay, then the let's only, please, for me. Yes, sir. Can these changes that we're wanting to change the charter, can we still do that effectively through an ordinance instead of changing the charter? No, sir. The, what the ordinance does is it provides the opportunity for it to be placed on the ballot so it's ultimately the people who decide. Thank you. Your, your passing this does not affect any change to the charter. It is the result of an election. If Thank for whatever you. reason this does not make it to the supervisor of elections in time, the voters will not even get an opportunity to have a say whether it wants to or Thank not. Thank you. You clarified that for me. Thank you very much. Councilman Maniscalco. Just to make it uh, a little more plain, the ordinance is the path to get to the ballot. Thank you. Right. The Thank mayor you. can veto it right. and block it, right. and that's it. Or it can, that veto can be overridden with a, with a supermajority vote of five votes, and it still goes to the ballot. But the mayor can still block the process. That's just how the process is. That's it. But you need the ordinance to Thank you. get it on the ballot. Councilmember One right. more time. And the only time I can ever remember that a council member overrode the mayor was back in the 70s on a five to two vote. And it was regarding <coughs> the raise for the fire department. That's it. That's the only, maybe there's others, but I haven't been here since straight since 1974 either. So I don't know what happened in between. Okay. Mr. Shelby. One last point, and again, I don't want to beat this to death, but I want it to be absolutely clear because council member Maniscalco made a point that I want to clarify and make more succinct. If city council does not have the opportunity to override a veto by the deadline of the supervisor of elections, it will not make the ballot. Thank you. Agenda item, agenda item number 81. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to speak to this agenda item? Good morning, Connie Burton. We have been here to hear about a strong form of mayor government, or however you say it, it has felt like a dictatorship inside of our community. We would like to see this ordinance brought to the voters without any more hesitation, delays, attempt not to get it to the supervisor election, so the community can finally say that our votes to our council members matter. We want you to have enough courage in the people to say that we have a right and a say of government in this city. And those that refuse to allow this ordinance to move forward will show that you don't believe in democracy. What is the fear? If the city is moving forward and the mayor is working in accordance with the citizens, why not? But all we hear is delay after delay after delay. We do not want a strong dictate form of government in this city 
We want one that when we vote for you guys, that you work in accordance to the issues of this community. Move it, burn the midnight oil, stay until you get it done. Do not bring it back to us and say it sat on the mayor's desk and it did not move. We have an election coming March the 7th. Those that have fear do not deserve to represent the interests of this community anymore. We're watching you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning again. Uh, it frustrates me for a, lot of, for a lot of reasons, actually. When you speak with your attorney and you ask him a question, and you may not be getting the answer that you're, that you're expecting, but you cut him off. And he can never, I'm sitting here and, and want to hear what the, what the total answer is, and I can never get it, because then y'all stop him. These, this, these, what, 80, 81, we've been talking about this for a while. And it always seems like in the ninth hour, all these things come up with questions. But you guys, like someone just pointed out, unanimously voted on 82, 83, and 84. What's the question? Whenever you, at this point, you should make sure the wording is correct and send it to the voters. Send it to the voters. And then if, if it fails, it fails in the voters. That's how uh, uh, you get the community involved. If the community is not showing up here, it's going to show up on the ballot. And I have an issue with just this. You talk about the... Um, uh, the uh, amendments and so forth, getting com uh, the, the committee, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the community to those meetings. I think it's a, it's a setup when y'all taxpayer money, you don't have a plan, a plan of enforcement to get information out to the community. You guys should be having surveys or, or something. What's the best way? Everybody's not going to go to your, uh, go to your website. But how do you get engaged and get to this information to the community? That's the million dollar question that y'all are not answering. And this is taxpayer money. A large punt, a, a, a chunk of your uh, uh, administration, the budget, should be communication to the community. Because nothing is getting out. Even when we have uh, uh, money in the budget for the community, they don't know about it. So this is ridiculous. All of this, if it, if it goes, trust the community. To send it to the ballot and let, the, let it fall where it may. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to wish to speak to agenda item number 81? I'm new to this. Please take um. Oh, the second reading. Um, how y'all doing? Uh, my name is Melvin Hicks. Um, I know all y'all. We all have history. How you doing, Councilman? <laughs> How you doing, sir? Um, yeah, a vote need to be on this. Y'all need to do something about this today. Um, I've been in y'all in this city for a while. I was kind of implementing and helping grow in y'all city. Um, this right here, I ain't been in y'all councilman for a long time. I took my name off the ballot for a reason. And um, y'all, y'all council right here has been very not doing y'all job. If we could pay for somebody wrongdoing, then y'all could do something. Um, it's new to me. I've been going through a lot, and the people have been going through a lot. Um, I don't believe in no strong mayor. I don't believe in no strong government. I believe in the people. Um, Y'all been doing wrong. Carson, Louis, Joseph, I don't know about you yet. Um, Orlando, Charlie. Um, this need to be for a vote. If y'all don't do something about this right now, y'all don't need to be in office. Y'all need to be locked up right now. This, I don't believe in strong government. I believe in strong people. I really do. Um, my life has been in danger a lot. 
I'm very scared right now. I'm scared because the police behind me. I don't know if they're going to shoot me in the back or not while I'm up here. I'm scared of the, the chief of staff right now. I don't want the same incident like he came up to me last time, intimidated me. Told me I shake his hand. Mr. Go Mr. Orlando Goods, I'll you, you look at me, sir. Um, whoever don't vote on this right now, today, it need to be a vote on it. Whoever don't do it. Craig Lattimore is very wrong. Craig Lattimore, we already know about Craig Lattimore. I'm very, I'm not very ready for this, but the people build, built this city. Y'all didn't build it. Y'all just elected officials. We elected y'all. They elected y'all. It seemed like I, I voted for some people up here one time before. I did. And um, I don't want to be, I know my time is up, but somebody need to be voting on this right now. If we could pay for somebody wrongdoing, if we could pay for y'all dinners and stuff like that, y'all lunches and everything, if y'all could support a chief, a chief Thank of, you, sir. of police like Thank that. You, sir. If y'all could support, support a, a chief of police who disgraced this city. Thank you, sir. And you too, sir, disgraced this city. <laughs> Anyone else wishing to speak to agenda number 81? Do we have anybody online? Second. A motion closed, but Councilman Vera. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I always like to explain my votes. I think that's really important, especially whenever I, I that's just me. Um, whenever I potentially look at switching a position or something of that nature for me, I owe the public um, and other people an explanation. That's a really big thing for me. It goes without saying. Um, I don't see this as I've been explained, as I understand it, as going up against a strong mere form of government. I don't. I just don't. It's a, it's a very small change. Councilman Miranda, please correct me if I'm wrong, sir, if I'm misconstruing you. It's inadvertent. You had said that the substance of this is non-objectionable. You just, it's the process. Okay, again, I don't want to uh, uh, misconstrue anything you said. This appears to be very, very reasonable. Uh, it, it goes without saying. I personally don't believe in the idea of the, the charter review supremacy, which is the idea that you can only get charter amendments through the charter review process. I think that I voted against a lot of charter proposals out there because I, I respectfully disagreed with them. But I do believe that council does have a role so long as it's done responsibly and reasonably. It goes without saying. Again, this appears to be reasonable. The changes that I see are you need to have that, that are mandated here. You need to have a city employee to be the interim, and then it's got to be done within 180 days. And then it goes to the public, the very public that was very, very involved in a nomination before, very involved in a nomination before. I think they deserve to have a say on this. So in terms of how I understand it, I think this is reasonable. So I will be voting yes. Thank you. No, Councilman Miranda. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, I asked some hard questions about this. <laughs> And I wanted the public to understand exactly what was going on and how the process worked and how it worked in the past and how it worked in the, in the present. So although I voted no in the first one, like Mr. Vieira, I'm satisfied this is going to do no harm to the strong mayor form of government. Any other comments? Move to close. Motion to close by Councilman Good, seconded by? Second. Councilwoman Hurtak. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Councilman Vieira, would you please read this? Maybe, I mean, maybe Councilman Goose wants to. It's your, if, or you don't care. Or Councilman Bureau, would you okay. please read this? Yes, sir. And this is item number 81. Uh, I move an ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption ordinance relating to the government of the city of Tampa, Florida, submitting to electors of the city a proposed amendment to the revised charter of the city of Tampa 1975 as amended to clarify that the mayor's nominations for heads of departments and other city employees as set out in section 6.03 must be approved by four votes of the city council and to provide for interim appointments of existing city employees by the mayor for a maximum of 180 days, providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Roll call vote. Herta? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goose? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. 
And seat draw. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Agenda item number 82. Again, for council's consideration, um, Martin Shelby, city council attorney, this is a revision to uh, revise the process for term limits to limit the ability of members to serve more than a total of four consecutive full terms consistent with council's direction. Um, uh, and um, it's been brought back for second reading consideration. Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you very much. And again, I don't see any uh, issue with this um, because we, we voted to support this unanimously. I don't know how it's going to go today. But uh, we didn't vote for uh, permanent term limits on May, as the president has treated two terms and you're done, because even though it says a total of four consecutive full terms, it doesn't stop a council member from ever running again with, with that four-year gap. So we're not creating a permanent term limit system. So I think it's, again, a, a no, no issue, and I'm happy to support it. Councilman Miranda. I'm not opposed to this as long as, I, and it doesn't say the mayor, so I have no problem with it. Uh, it said mayor, I wouldn't vote for it, but it, it does not. In other words, the mayor serves two terms, comes back eight years later, four years later, or whatever. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Councilman uh, Carlson. Yeah, and um, just contrary to the, again, to the disinformation that's been put out there, um, uh, these are not all, um, uh, none, of the, none of them, in fact, are, limiting the strong mayor former government this one in fact has nothing to do with the mayor um, this one is actually the city council limiting our own ability to run for office in the future and so um, i'd let, just like to make sure that everybody knows this is city council limiting ourselves uh, not in any way limiting strong mayor former government thank you. is there anyone in the public that wishes to make comment on agenda item number 82 Um, yes, 82. Thank you for clarifying it for me. Yes, it should be a term limit. <laughs> Why not? No one's above the law. We know how four years, eight years has been for the country, where people have been in office so long. Charlie, Miranda. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Oh, my bad. I apologize. Talk, talk to oh. council oh. as a whole, not oh. individually. I mean, we, we know how it has been for the country as a whole. Now, it should be a term limit. No one should be ever able to run over and over again. It, it, it shows uh, people above the law. It shows that people can, can be bribed. It, it shows that people could be bought. We, just, we know that right now. People have been bought. And the city has been bought. People who have been elected, uh, the elected officials have been over and over again. Like Buckhorn, it, it's been proven with him been proven with Buckhorn. It's been proven with our city council right now. It's been proven. We're in 2023. I made a statement yesterday. And I said this statement, I'm going to say it again. Yesterday was going to determine the 20, 2023. And it has determined your 2023. We have to look forward to the future right now. If y'all don't look forward to the future and passing this along, that means that y'all don't, don't need to be here. It's, it's called new blood, not old blood. New, new ideas, not old ideas. Old ideas shaped, shaped and ruined this city, nation, how you want to call it. And we need new blood. The old ideas have the city council has been putting along in this city, new growth and stuff, has old. Y'all have people, y'all have staffers doing y'all job for y'all. Y'all not doing no, y'all job for, for y'all not even doing y'all job. Y'all have a city attorney that wanna do stuff above the law. I understand the law very well, very well. No one should have go over the term limit, no one. It seemed like I've been looking at y'all for years, decades, up in here fighting for my rights and the people's rights. Now, it should be a term limit. Two years, that's more than fair. No one should ever run like that again. 
because we already know what's going on. No businessman should be on this council. No businessman, because he has ties in the community, and he, he could do stuff. No businessman should be on this council. No one with a business degree should be on this council. The people should be on this council. Thank, Thank you, you very much, sir. <laughs> no businessman. Do we have anyone online? Second. Motion closed by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilwoman Hurtak. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Councilman Maniscalco, would you please read this? Thank you very much. This is uh, an item 82E 2022-8CH2, uh, ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption, an ordinance, related, an ordinance relating to the government of the City of Tampa, Florida, submitting to the electors of the City a proposed amendment to the revised charter of the City of Tampa of 1975 as amended to amend section 2.02 to revising term limits of City Council members to limit the ability of council, members of City Council to serve more than a total of four consecutive full terms effective with the City of Tampa election in 2027, providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. Roll call vote. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertek? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Agenda item number 83. Again, Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney for Council's Consideration for Second Reading uh, is another um, uh, ordinance to send to the voters, um, and that is to amend Section 5.01 to provide the Citizen Review Board to select legal counsel who is not a city employee to advise the Citizen Review Board with funding provided by the city, uh, and that is for Council's consideration. Seeing no discussion from council, is there anyone in chambers that wishes to speak to agenda item number 83? Come forward, sir. Um, I'd like to ask what year are we in? 2023, right? And this is the 1975, right? So if we go by 19, if we go I'm still going by 1975, that means something is very wrong. So that means that it should the citizen review board, the citizen review board should select legal counsel, should be able to select legal counsel. We in 2023, not 1975. So we, something doesn't balance out with me. So the Citizen Review Board should be able to select legal counsel. Should. It should be a right by the citizens to select legal counsel. Should the Citizen Review Board. We are not in 1975. I, I keep on seeing that 1975 in this. Being 2023. Yeah. Is it all fair? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Council. Let's be quick. Totally agree with it. I think that there should be a separation, a separation with the attorneys. They, they should not be or work for the city. They should be totally independent. So I'm in full support of this. Thank you. Anyone else in chambers? Do we have anyone online? A motion closed by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilwoman Hertak. Councilwoman Hertak. Ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption. An ordinance relating to the government of the City of Tampa, Florida, submitting to the electors of the city a proposed amendment to the revised charter of the City of Tampa of 1975, as amended, to amend Section 5.01 to provide for the Citizen Review Board to select legal counsel who is not a city employee to advise the Citizen Review Board with funding provided by the city providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion made by Councilwoman Hertak, seconded by Councilman Goods. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertak? Yes. Carlson? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Agenda item number 84. 
Martin Shelby City Council Attorney. Item 84 is the last of the um, five proposed amendments to the charter that are being, uh, that are, are, are to send to the um, voters to be placed on the ballot on um, March 7th. And this one is to amend uh, Section 1010, uh, the charter review, to have it be um, every eight years instead of every 10 years uh, per council's direction and submitted for your um, consideration. Any discussion? Councilman Mascocco. I, I'm in full support of uh, this. Um, it was mentioned, you know, the Charter of 1975 because that was the last major overhaul in modernizing the existing, the way the city operates and its charter and amendments have been made to that. We just used the 1975 as a reference point. Um, but having said all that, we did have the Charter Review Commission um, with wonderful individuals on there that, that did their, their public service. Uh, and to do this at a more regular, uh, on a more regular schedule, I think is, is wise, considering we didn't do anything since 1975 until 2017, 18. So I think it's all good. Councilman Miranda. Chairman, if I may, I just want to reflect on uh, 1975. Uh, the lady who brought the charter review was Jan Platt. Very fine lady, later served here, served as a county commissioner, wonderful lady. Uh, did a lot of things for the city that was, uh, at that time, dormant, like environment and stuff like that, bringing it up. And, and those that served was Jan Platt, Sandy Friedman, Kathy Barger, Lee Duncan, Charlie Spicola, Lloyd Copeland, and the guy sitting here. So, but I haven't been here since 79 all the way through, let me again say that. But it was a fine council. I worked with a lot of good people. And it was Jan Platt who started that. And at that time, the charter had something about pigs and horses and all kind of stuff that you would never think of. But they were there. And she had the foresight to look into something that I don't know when it was done before that. But she had the foresight to start that. And uh, she has done a, was here in the county commission and a fine lady through her whole life. She's a, a wonderful servant, was a wonderful, she passed away a few years back, but a wonderful servant to the community and to the county. Thank you. Anyone else? Public, public comment. Anyone in the public wish to speak to agenda number 84? Do we have anyone online? Move closed. Second. We have a motion closed by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Councilman Goods. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. File number E2022-8CH2. Ordinance has been presented for second reading and adoption. An ordinance relating to the government of the city of Tampa, Florida, submitting to the electors of the city a proposed amendment to the revised charter of the city of Tampa of 1975 as amended to amend section 10.10 .10 to correct a scrivener's error and to provide that commencing in 2025, a charter review advisory commission be established every eight years instead of every 10 years and legal counsel and professional facilitator for the commission be hired with city council approval, providing an effective date. Who seconded that? I'm I sorry. Uh, we have a motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goose? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Councilman Hertek. Um, I have a question for our uh, city council attorney. Um, Mr. Shelby, uh, would it be presumptuous to put these on the January 19th agenda in case we do need to look at them again to provide proper, um, uh, proper notice? My, rec my recommendation, councilwoman, would be to go through the process if the chair would be so kind as to work with the clerk to sign those so we can get them to the mayor's desk today to start the process. Um, there is a process that's set forth in the charter that requires how this be done. Um, if this has to come back, we can arrange for that to be done. I think it would be, um, I understand what your intention is, but I think it could be accomplished without necessarily doing that and follow the process as we always have for every ordinance and see where this process takes us. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you. 
All right, we will go now to agenda item number 62, is, which was asked to be pulled for staff reports. Hello. Nicole Travis, Administrator of Development and Economic Opportunity. I'm also your interim CRA director. I was requested to um, make this presentation and to pull this agenda item off of consent. Um, and it's the presentation that I have for you is exactly what I presented to the CRA board at the December 8th meeting. So for the public's, um, I believe the desire was so that the public um, can see what was done with our budget allocations and the CRA funding relative to what we were doing on affordable housing initiatives. Thank you. So just a, a little bit to recap on how we got here. Back in 2020, Councilman Carlson made a motion uh, to, for the board to work towards an aspirational goal of 30% allocation of CRA district funds with all, within all of the redevelopment districts. Um, consequently, in 2022, that we talked about doing that again to um, use unused fund, look at unused funds um, that discussion carried forward through our budget process, and um, you then agreed to take up a special meeting um, to do this 30% allocation. At that time, we took your um, request, and Mr. Elise Drumgo, the deputy it, um, Administrator, almost said deputy city manager. <laughs> the deputy administrator uh, went to all of the CAC meetings, um, explaining the board's intent and the aspiration of 30% goal for affordable housing initiatives to be set aside. And so, with that, we brought to you at a December meeting um, what 30% would look like for each one of the CRA districts. Just to refresh your memory, the item that's highlighted in red is where we took that revenue from, the line item that we took that revenue from, and um, in green is where we put the money for affordable housing initiatives. And so I really want to thank the Budget and Finance Office for working with us to create a special category uh, for affordable housing initiatives within the CRA budget. So any money that we expend can now be captured under that specific project and you can account for it along the way. So in the downtown, CRA district, um, we have $6.9 million that was pulled from um, the neighborhood infrastructure line item to be dedicated towards affordable housing initiatives. I failed to mention that this passed unanimously at the CRA board meeting, and it's here before you as a financial resolution to appropriate those funds. In the channel district, um, <coughs> We took $3 million, a little over $3 million from the capital improvement projects and put that into the affordable housing initiatives. In Tampa Heights, um, we have about $140,000 going to affordable housing initiatives. Central Park CRAs are some lower increment um, CRA. We're um, pulling $100,000 from the capital improvement projects for affordable housing initiatives. And in EBOR 1, um, there were several line items that we uh, took that revenue from, but we have $945,000 um, allocated for affordable housing initiatives. And in EBOR 2, 426000 um, for affordable housing initiatives. In the East Tampa CRA, we have two, we moved 2.4, almost $2.5 million to affordable housing initiatives. And then, and that's in addition to what funds was already in affordable housing initiatives. Drew Park has a little over a million dollars. Um, and that money came out of their neighborhood infrastructure improvements funds. West Tampa. Um, allocated about $2.7 million in affordable housing initiatives, again, coming from neighborhood infrastructure improvements. So ultimately, um, we have about $17 million coming from the, 
for the adjustments from that 30% um, set aside that you requested. You also asked us to look at um, interest earned on each CRA trust fund, and that was a little over $2 million, so $2.2 million. Ultimately, um, the CRA, you should be proud, that the CRA is um, contributing or uh, moving funds for $20.2 million towards affordable housing initiatives. Um, on your resolution, resolution number 60, item 62, it says 16 million. The reason that number is different is because there was already $4 million in the appropriate allocations. This is just moving the difference um, to that bucket. I'm available for any questions that you may have. Good job, sir. Yeah, I failed to do this at the CRA board meeting. Can I just one minute, please? Can I really want to thank Elise Jongo for, um, you know, beating the pavement and going to the CAC meetings um, to make sure that they understood the board's intent. There's still a lot of questions um, from some districts that we don't have any programs yet, that the money is just being allocated. And for anyone that's watching, um, we have programs that exist in some CRAs that we can be replicated in others, but we're also asking the CACs to be creative in figuring out how they can um, work with developers or existing homeowners to um, stabilize housing affordability in each one of the CRA districts. So thank you for the opportunity for letting me publicly thank Elise Stromgo on his work. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, I'm gonna publicly thank both of you because, uh, so just so the public is clear, this started as 10.7 million that we thought we were going to be able to get from the CRAs. And instead, you all were able to find 20.2 that is huge, it's gigantic, it is, it, is, it, it, it is a game changer. And so I wanna say thank you again, and I am excited because I know that CRAs have a little bit more wiggle room, the ability to be more creative, and I'm hoping that the, what, we come, what comes out of these CRAs uh, is replicable, replicable in other CRAs and throughout the city yeah. that are in areas that don't don't have My a CRA. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just, I'm really excited about this. I can't wait to see what we can do. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilman Goods. Mr. Drumgo, I'm gonna take your, your bow, sir. You do good he work. He wouldn't come up here. I made him come to council well, this you, morning. When you do good work, you have to be recognized, and we know you guys have been taking a lot of extra tasks. Uh, I know in reference to the CBA and some other things. I know you really have been the catalyst behind a, a lot of work with Ms. Travis. I want to personally thank you for moving the needle on this. And I know uh, you understand CRAs, and I know you understand where we need to go with our CRAs. And people have to understand it's not about social services with CRAs. And I know you've been telling our managers that, that we got to focus on infrastructure and housing, which is what the CRA is meant to be for. So I'm glad we have somebody who understands it, and we'll start the implementation. And I want to say the key word, we, we've got a lot of programs. I'm tired of hearing about the programs. We have to now start implementing the programs. That means staff or whatever you need to do, I'm anxious to hear about next week, how we're going to start doing that implementation road, the CRA, and how we're going to look at how that staff is going to be re revised, revised or whatever, start, start implementing the process. So that's what I'm keen on next week. I want to hear about the process with this kind of money, how we're going to move it. But I thank you for your work, sir. Mr. Councilman Miranda, uh, just echoing Mr. Goods, uh, congratulations for the work you've done. <clears throat> very calculating very, very quickly on the math. When, you, when I saw the numbers, what you took out equaled about 20% of the monies available. In each one, you took out about 20% to make the total uh, 17 plus what you found in interest or $20 million. That's, I, I believe that's about what you did. Just casually, I looked at the numbers, and I think you took about 20% of each budget of the, of the districts of the new, of new money. districts. Some of the, um, it ended up being 30% because they are, some of them have yeah. money calculate, I allocated already. I yeah. understand, but thank you very much for Absolutely. using that number. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, a few things real fast. One, to say thank you to, to both of you and anybody else who worked on this, plus thanks to the um, CACs, the Community Advisory Committees, who worked hard and had a lot of difficult conversations to come to this. Um, unfortunately, this process started almost two and a half years ago. Think about the people we could have helped um, through all that time, and, and the two of you are new, uh, but, but previously um, staff told us it would be very difficult or impossible, and then they just didn't do it. <laughs> and so 
thank you all for jumping in, even though for you it's a part-time job, you jumped in and, and, and did this, so we appreciate it. Um, in, in your other portfolio, I think you also oversee affordable housing. What, how much is the city's overall budget for affordable housing, not including the CRA? I should have been prepared for that. It has to be, um, all of our funding is over 55 million. But that includes the CRA year. money, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about 35, 36 million. I would just, I would just challenge the administration out of 50 or so million, we found 20 and out of a $1.9 billion budget, I wish the administration would find more than 36. And also it asked their communication department when they talk about the total dollar, please separate CRA. It's a separate entity, although we're connected. And if the administration wants to take credit for affordable housing, they need to find the money in, their, in the larger budget that they control because it's, it's kind of embarrassing. And I know you're a staff working toward that, but it's kind of embarrassing out of a $1.9 billion budget, there's only 36 million. We found 20 in just a few months here. Um, the last thing I'll say to anybody watching who may think that the CRA money be, should be used for something else, the, C, the, the law that creates the CRA is very specific about what it can be used for. It can only be used for four things, to alleviate slum, blight, affordable housing, and disease. And most of the time, other than COVID, we don't really have disease. But what has happened in the past with Tampa and other cities is that slum and blight has been misinterpreted to say that we can, we can subsidize developers. And um, some arguments have been made by people politically that, that we should be using this money to subsidize developers. Whether that's legal or not, I don't know, and I'm not gonna go back in and, 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 and hear those discussions, but, um, but we're using the money now for what it's meant to be used for. If, we're going to, if the rest of the city is gonna subsidize the CRAs, which is what happens, we, the rest of the city wants to know that this money is being used for the best possible purposes. Subsidizing one developer when the other nine don't get subsidized is anti-competitive, it's anti-capitalist, anti-democracy. Um, what we should be doing is providing the environment where every developer can be successful, whether they're building affordable housing or others. In this case, what we're gonna be doing is, is solving a market problem or market failure where there's not enough affordable housing. And I thank uh, the staff for doing this, and I want everybody to know this is exactly what the CRA money should be using for. Some things in the past that might not should have been used. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you allow me? Mr. Carlson, you're right on a bunch of fronts, but in some of the research that I've been doing in reference to the housing crisis, it's not that we don't have enough places to live. It's the fact that our livability with the wages that, I, that people are making in some of the cities can't afford the rent prices. Because I can go to any of these apartment complexes and they have available apartments. They have available apartments. So it's not that we don't have the stock. Like people say we, have the, we, we, we need the stock. No, you don't. We have the stock. The problem is you talk about a livable wage. We don't have a livable wage to compete with the prices of apartments at this particular juncture. So we have to look at that how do, we, how do we fix that balance? Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can or not. I don't know if there's such thing as a livable way or this. I don't, I don't know, but doing my research, you look at the, the whole system. If I can't afford to pay my rent, my utilities, which are all included, or pay, or transportation, it's hard to say I can pay my rent if I can't meet my needs. So uh, I, I just take that's the problem. I, I keep hearing there's a housing shortage. There ain't no housing shortage. The problem is hey, we do have a housing shortage. Hold on now. I, I, I can, I can. But, it, but I understand exactly. I, you, what you're you, you know where I'm going with that. Yeah. You know, from an economic development perspective, I'm going to just put on the, the economic development hat for a second. That this is, um, it's not just about supply and demand and having the units. It is about um, wages people being able to live, it's about transportation, it's about education, it's about upward mobility um, for communities. And so holistically, these are things that we consider as a community that we have to look at, that the city itself, local government itself cannot solve. So it takes us working with our nonprofit partners, our uh, private sector companies, and any business any business that the city engages on, and we're doing that, right? We're looking at second chances, we look, ban the box, you're, all of our EBO participation, all the different things that we're doing, including paying our lowest paid employees and making sure that they're raised to a livable wage. So I think holistically we're doing that, but we have to continue doing that. When you look at the statistics of um, 
the income in the city of Tampa, the income has increased, especially over, through COVID, significantly when people are moving here with higher jobs, but the, inc the wages of our brown and black community has not increased um, in that same time period. And so uh, this is, it's, it is what it what is. What do you believe so, about inclusionary zoning areas? I mean, well, I, we think those are cozy to change. I think that could help us with that. Well, so some of the things that you have on your agenda today were based on a workshop that we did back in October, and you have been making small in incremental changes on your land development code to allow for some of these things. But I want to remind you that I brought some changes to you on affordable housing issues to which you said that you were going to support and you ultimately did not support. And so I, I'm saying that in a not so delicate way that we were doing everything that we can on a policy perspective and we workshop the items, but it's not a silver bullet. It, you have to be intentional about some of these decisions that you're making. Um, so I'm not gonna relive that and I'm not gonna tell you that I'm bitter about it because it's 2023. And I'm moving on, right? But we spent an incredible amount of time trying to give you policies and ways to move the needle and move forward, and council elected not to do that. So when you talk about inclusionary zoning, we're gonna come back and look at bonus density. Um, talked about but we've talked about bonus density, but I, I just want to remind you that we talk about these things, we workshop them, we get your consent to move forward, and when we bring them, you have to be willing to take the leap um, even in, an uncomfortable public setting, even when you're getting pushback on it. So it's, it's, I, if it was a silver bullet, every community would have done it and have solved the challenge. It's not. But if you're talking about that ADU system. It's not just ADU. I brought to you special, um, this, the use, um, affordable housing as a class of, a specified use. There were a couple other things that we brought and they were fully supported until we got time to the ordinance and then you guys decided not to do it. And it's more than, it's, it's not just that. I, listen, it's 2023, we're not doing that. We can always revisit. You know? We can always, uh. <laughs> <laughs> always revisit. <laughs> Councilman Guzzi, you finished. Okay. Councilman Miranda. Thank you very much. And, and I know you mentioned ADUs. There was a big article in the uh, Tampa Bay Times. Mm -hmm. And it looked great until you looked at the numbers. How in the world can a 600 square foot house cost, I forgot, 258,000 without the land, and an 800 square foot house, or ADU? Cost of construction. Cost 300 and some thousand. Mm -hmm. Might as well go rob a bank. Well, we're not gonna do that now. Well, not you. <laughs> I'm not saying you guys. I'm saying it's $400 no. a square foot and above. I never see that even in a big house on a mansion on the side of a canal somewhere. But when I saw those prices and I just looked at it, oh, I put the paper away. I don't, ADUs are definitely not going to solve our, I understand our issue. It, I think what it will do, it just provides another option, right? Um, I understand that, and I'm not bringing it up for a debate. Or, I, I want you to feel happy in 2023, okay? <laughs> I just brought it up. I don't know. I just brought it up because my colleague here brought it up, and I wanted to. I don't know, know if you want me to feel ADU happy costs. in 2023. It costs twice the amount of, of, to build an ADU than build a house. Give me a break. Yeah, with the th some of the changes that we brought to you was um, things that are conditional use that could be allowed by right, so that it limits the it shortens the period of time and the process time for developers to go through and um, do these, to make these developments happen. Developers want certainty. I mean, you're gonna hear me say that, it's gonna be my mantra for 2023 as we work to, um, on our land development codes. Developers need certainty. And if our community particularly needs more units, affordable housing units, we have to give them certainty. They have to understand when they enter into the development process, how long it's going to take, what are the requirements, what are they gonna to have to, what's the give and take, but they don't have that level of certainty now. And so we're gonna continue working through that um, and working on our process and do what we can on the, the policy side and the regulatory side to help you through this. This was supposed to be my happy presentation of 2023. But <laughs> anyway. Any else, anything else for me? Anyone else? I appreciate you guys much and you should be proud of um, the allocation of $20 million for affordable housing initiatives. Yes, Mr. Chair. Ms. Travis, as, as 
all of us up here have expressed thank you. Thank you, partner. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Carlson, this is part of your committee. Do you want to move this resolution now, or do you want to wait and move it with the rest of your committee resolutions? Up to you. I have you move it now. You. Okay. Uh, we have a second for this. Yeah. We have a motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman uh, Goods. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. All right, agenda item number three, file number PW23-78734. Come on. Good morning, Council. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Uh, before Mr. Bear gets started, you know, I really enjoy sitting and listening to public comment because it, again, all the things that you said today, this is, it comes pure from the community. Um, but one thing that, you know, I know each week you get a briefing, I know each week you see each agenda item kind of in its, its own space. And, and just to kind of postscript what Ms. Travis and Mr. Drumgrove just did, but by council approving the job order contracting some time ago, you've already increased the BBE portion of that by almost 25%. That's putting a lot of money into small job processes in the city. Not only that, it opened an opportunity to look to do the owner-occupied rehab. When I met with Ms. Travis, I said, let's try this. Let's try and get out of the box and do something. So you should celebrate some of these wins that don't seem to pay dividends. And, and I want to bring one more thing to your attention, is that I had asked Mr. Hart, Ms. Wins here today, she didn't know I'd be saying this, but congratulations to her office for listening to council all the way back to when Councilman Dingfelder asked for us to look at more equal business opportunity and you have kept your foot on the gas with that and the mayor has done the bridges to business and we've split contracts and gave more things but I just want to because Brad's going to talk in itemized form but I have asked for Mr. Hart's office on an agenda basis to give me the EBO data every single two weeks and then also do it for the aggregate of the fiscal year. And just in BB alone, we're almost $14.7 million year to date, and we've only been in the budget for a quarter. And in this agenda alone, BBE represents over $6 million, which is 53% of all the EBO opportunity that's going just into this agenda. So one, continuous improvement has to be continuous. We have to come up with new ideas, sheltered market, bid discounts, splitting contracts, having more opportunity in the community for engagement to understand the bid process, the selection process. But what I'm here to say is that the public sees these agenda items one on one on one on one, but oftentimes you don't hear it, the public doesn't hear it in the aggregate of how well you're doing and how well we're supporting the growth of equal business opportunity, which is giving uh, small businesses and equal business opportunities of, of color an opportunity that they have not seen uh, over time. So just wanted to put that preamble in before Mr. Baird went. Uh, mm -hmm. Jim. Councilman Goods. Uh, Chief, that, and that's why I ask Mr. Beard all the time, like you said, sometimes mm -hmm. the public really, they see the numbers, they, they really know the breakdown. Mm -hmm. That's why yeah. he stabbed me. I said, Brad, the first thing I ask him, don't tell me about nothing. I want to hear the breakdown. It's the first thing I ask him. So, and sometimes when it's not there, I said, Brad, explain why it's not there so people can know right. why it's not there. So people are not angry and say, well, you got this contract. Yada, 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 that. So I'm glad we're doing that now. I'm glad we've got job, especially now with our housing situation, be able to have that owner occupant rehab, let that go to there to speed that process up and get it moving with that implementation. So I'm glad you made mention that. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Brad Baird, Deputy Administrator of Infrastructure. Uh, here to talk on item uh, three, uh, which is a water utility uh, relocation contract. Actually, it's a contract with our three low bidders, um, uh, totaling up to uh, $34.4 million um, for uh, uh, a project that's part of our pipes program. And I, I want to point out, you know, as the Chief of Staff just pointed out, 
Um, back in September of 2019, when we approved uh, the pipes program, when City Council approved the pipes program, um, the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion was a ma major part, right? I mean, it was a big tenet of what we wanted to accomplish. And the opportunities as part of the pipes program were going to be huge. Well, um, th these contracts, these three contracts, um, Honestly, they exceeded my expectations of what we were thinking back then. Um, but I will go through the, the breakdown as, as Councilman Goods has, has asked me to do. Um, the first contract with uh, JBS Contracting um, is for uh, $9.7 million, and it um, achieving EBO participation of 23.6%. And it's, it's not all... Uh, black business enterprise, by the way, that's a majority of it. But uh, black BBEs include 9.3 percent, small local business enterprise 9.2 percent, um, Asian business enterprise 4. Point, uh, almost 5 percent, 4.96, and then his, Hispanic business enterprise at uh, 0.15 percent. Um, Dallas One Corporation um, is uh, has a goal of 21.1 percent. <coughs> Uh, of which uh, BBEs are 17.1, SLBEs 2.56, and W uh, Women Business Enterprise 1.44. And then uh, finally, the, the third low bidder, RTD Construction Inc., um, has a EBO participation goal totaling 20.9%, um, of which 14.4 uh, is BBE, 5.4 HBE, and 1.1. SLBE. And I point out, all three of these contracts have over um, have over 20 percent participation. I personally have never seen that in a in horizontal construction. I've seen that in some vertical construction, but when you do the math, that's almost seven and a half million dollars that wasn't counted in the in the uh, numbers John just gave you. Um, going to EBO firms that and that is really amazing thank you very much sir and you know uh, uh, this was brought up during public comment a comment was made you know a lot of numbers big <coughs> numbers coming through today on the agenda and this is the first of the big numbers that we're approving but you just explained specifically how it is benefiting and numbers that you have have not seen you know 20 plus percentage points uh, for minority owned black owned women owned whatever it is that they're, they're getting a piece of this pie, and when I say pie, it's equity, it's equitable. It's, you know, it's not just the, the big contractors that get all the contracts. You talked about the three lowest bids, and you specifically clarified, what did you say, $7 million? Almost oh. seven and a half, yes. And this is just one item that we may be approving today. You have a lot more, so I think we're on a, a very good trajectory, and again, the rising tide lifts all boats. So thank you for that. Councilwoman Welcome. Hurtari. Um, I, I want to echo um, what Councilman Maniscalco said, but I also want to say um, what you highlighted that we haven't talked about before. And this is, this is what I like when, when we have asked for you all to, to try to increase these numbers. I love the fact that you said this is horizontal development, which means yes. you're getting more people on new types of jobs yep. and I think that is what I that is what I want to commend you on today because expanding the types of work that we can give to local small and minority contractors is huge it's going to it's going to have ripple waves um, or, uh, however that said uh, and I just want to say thank you so much for that um, as always we want to we want to um, say thank you for that 20% but I really like the fact that you highlighted the horizontal development, just a, a new space. And I love that you all keep challenger, challenging yourselves to find new places that we can find this growth. So thank you. You're Council welcome. Members, good. You go. Bradley, we talked about, you know, I, I hate that word, good faith effort. <laughs> yes, I talked sir. about that. I, I don't like that word, uh, you know, but I'm glad that, and I, I, I say this, when you tell the people up front, this is where you, we need to be. <laughs> and we stay firm on where we need to be, we will continue to grow versus good faith effort. I mean, and making sure that we're, like we talked about, making sure we're monitoring 
who's doing the work. And we, you know, again, we talked about who should be looking. And I said it from day one, if we approve this pipeline, we have, need to have people making sure we're looking on these jobs and making sure we're just getting a blanket number in, 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 in years past. Or you come back and tell me, uh, well, nobody got the job. You heard these numbers, but nobody's there. I'm not hearing that right now. So obviously, I'm thinking it's there now. So you just want to make sure we keep the foot on the gas there and make sure when they go in this, full, this good faith situation, we're making sure, hey, this council wants us to be a steadfast pace getting those numbers up there. So we appreciate it and hope we'll continue to do that work. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, I don't know who, who the contractor is, the one who was doing Armenia Avenue and Tampa Bay Boulevard in that mm -hmm. area. But I went to the coffee shop the other day and some friends of mine stopped me and said, this guy showed us how it's done. He actually, they were looking at it and the gentleman, I'm sure is not the, the employee of that company, whoever the company is, actually showed them how the machine works and they were at all that somebody took the time to show them how their money's being spent and what it does to the pipe and how the pipe moves inside the other pipe. So whoever the company is, from all of us, Adam, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's um, Kiwit uh, Construction is overseeing that work. Um, they actually have subcontracted the pipe bursting, which is a brand new tech, I shouldn't say brand new, but it's a new technology. And it's, it's really fascinating how they do that work. So thank you. Any other comments, questions? Mm -hmm. Second. Motion to move the resolution by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Okay, Brad Baird, uh, Deputy Administrator of Infrastructure, addressing item four, um, which is uh, a change order to add $3 million to a citywide meter hydrant valve installation a contract uh, with RTD Construction. Um, in, in this case, uh, the uh, EBO participation is 6.4%, uh, breaks down to BBE at 4.15 and HBE at 2.3. Um, so um, somewhat of a drop off, um, and I don't know if you want me to address why that drop off. I think so. It's very good reasons. Um, on uh, item three, those contracts included a lot of pipeline relocation. This contract and, um, and their plan work. So you can plan for that, you know, participation and the opportunities are there. In, in item four and in item five, which is a similar contract, um, there's certainly not as much opportunity um, because it's primarily hydrants and valves and not a lot of pipeline. And on top of that, um, it's emergency work. So it happens around the clock and they're on call. So for those two reasons, uh, the numbers aren't as good, um, but those hydrants and valves are purchased through EBO firms. Well, that's Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Second. Mm -hmm. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Miranda, miss, excuse me, Councilman Miranda. And, and just for the record, when, when you see that these things are being, that the water meters are being replaced, it's not that they're wrong fast is that they start to run slow. So they the taxpayers get a break, but the yellow <coughs> taxpayers do not, and therefore you have to change them about every 10 or 12 years. If not, you're gonna get a very low water bill when you have used much more water. I believe I'm correct. That is correct. Uh, again, we have a motion on the floor by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Agenda item number five. Item number five is uh, similar to item number four, except it is a change order adding $4 million um, for uh, Kimmins Contracting Corporation for uh, citywide meter hydrant valve installation and replacement work. Move the resolution. Motion to move the resolution by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Thank you. And item six, I do not recall if you moved that earlier this morning or not. We did not, okay. Yeah. Item six is um, uh, hiring uh, Evoqua Water Technologies for odor and corrosion control services uh, in the amount of $7.4 million. It includes a 16% manufacturer price escalation. Um, however, this firm has not asked for a price escalation for five years, um, and the initial agreement was for five years. 
Um, so that averages out to a little more than 3% a year, which uh, we felt was fair. We did a comparative analysis to other municipalities throughout the state of Florida, and we are um, at the low end of uh, price for these type of services. Councilwoman Hertek. Uh, I just want to say thank you again, um, because when I had a question, my first thing when I, uh, when I talked to you yesterday, I said 16%, and you gave me this, that entire uh, <laughs> rationale and reasoning behind it but but no this is the point i want to make is i appreciate that you all are doing the work when you see those price increases and i love the fact that you even went to other municipalities to see where we are in the balance and i just want to want to thank you and your team again for the for going above and beyond making sure we're getting a, a decent deal and if we're not going out for rebids so i really appreciate that um it definitely uh, makes approving this a lot easier uh, w with no questions behind it. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion to move the resolution by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Spirit. Agenda item number seven, file number E2021-8, chapter 18. Morning, Council. Uh, Captain Patrick Mesmer, Tampa Police Department. Uh, this is a continuation just to give you a uh, <coughs> little synopsis of our body-worn camera annual report that I came in front of council and presented, I believe, back in August. There was a question about uh, specifically the mute feature of the body-worn camera, about if there's any data that tracks how often that's used. Um, I said that there was not because the system does not uh, specifically track that. Um, we were working, we were asked to work with our vendor, Axon, to come up with a way so we could track that globally rather than individually through our um, random quality assurance checks. Um, I've got a, Mr. Grayson from Axon is with us today. If you guys have any questions for him about how that process is going, they are still in the process of um, working that out so we can get the opportunity to basically get that aggregate data um, rather than just specific individualized data about how that is used. So if there's any additional questions or any comments from Mr. Grayson, Councilwoman Hertak, this was your motion. Do you have any questions? Um, I'm, I'm going to leave it for Mr. Goots. Then you will have no questions afterwards. Uh, I may. Then why don't you go ahead and ask your questions now? I'm good, I'm good with letting him go. Councilman Goots. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is Council, uh, <clears throat> Councilwoman Hertak's baby, but, you know, as a councilman, I need to research as well. I did talk to some, some high-level uh, sheriff office officials uh, in reference to this mute situation. And from what they tell me, that system can do any and everything and get data as, as much as time as a person. If you, if you recorded it, it can go back and tell you when you recorded it, you stopped. They, they, I mean, it's telling me the system can do everything. And even with this mute phone, you said it can't be done. They're saying that that's kind of inaccurate. So maybe is our system different than what maybe the sheriff offices are using? Or maybe, I, I don't know. So the initial question that I got was, <clears throat> is there any data about how often it's used? So that is correct. We have an audit log. Each camera has an audit log. Every single thing that's done on that individual camera can be tracked. And we can look at that audit log uh, manually and see. So we just had a case, uh, an internal affairs case, where we pulled an officer's audit log for one shift. That audit log was about 30 pages, a uh, PDF document that we have to manually go through every single line and look and see what that is. So we have about 700 cameras. If we did that for every single officer, we'd have over 20,000 pages of data to manually look through and then manually calculate. So there is no way to get a number based on looking at those individual audit logs unless we manually go through it. What the software update is going to do is it, it will basically show us an aggregate number of videos and what percentage of those videos will have a mute function enabled in those videos. That technology does not uh, exist now. Again, Mr. Grayson can address it from Axon's perspective. Um, now, if there's another body-worn camera provider that might have a different system, I don't have any knowledge of that. I know the Sheriff's Office in Hillsborough County uses Axon as well, so they have the exact same system. But any specific technical questions, he's probably the best one to answer. 
Lady Master? <laughs> Certainly. Good morning, council members. My name is Andrew Grayson. I'm here on behalf of Axon this morning. Excuse me. Councilman Guzzi, you finished? No, he's going to ask the question. Okay. Uh, specifically, sir, could you restate the question? Yeah, I said that other departments say that that function is, is, it can be tracked, it can be done, and he's saying that yes, but it's so long, I guess you, you can't capture the data because it's so much. So is our system different than, than someone else's, or can what Commissioner or Councilman wants, can that be done? Or can you fix that system? The captain is correct. So the same system that Hillsborough County uses, Tampa Police Department also utilizes. Um, that can be tracked, but it's a very manual process, as the captain alluded to. Axon is working uh, rigorously today to automate that process to be available, uh, one, in the audit trail and then in the performance or compliance metrics of the body camera system. So basically, we just got to have another function to do what we really want to do, but, but the function is there, but we need to update the how, what we want. Correct? Yes, sir. It's a All super right. manual process All today, right. which is very so, uh, cumbersome on the agency. Yeah, so they were correcting what they were telling me, that they, it can be done, but apparently what we want to do, we don't. It needs to be updated. 100 percent, yes. Before I go to Councilman Carlson, <clears throat> how long will that take effect? Uh, currently, Axon's roadmap timeline has that on Q4 of 2023. I'm sorry, one more time. Uh, fourth quarter of 2023. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I think that this is, um, I'll leave the underlying issues to um, Council Member Hertek, but for me, this is an issue about transparency and communication with the public. Um, in the in the former police chief's report, um, it said that that as I remember it, it says there's no way to do this automatically or something like that. And so, then a, <clears throat> a reporter came out and said, um, "That's not true. We can uh, we, we can provide the data." And then the administration's response was, "No, we remember we put the word automatic in there, and so that makes the statement true." And my concern is that. The administration, especially communication from TPD, remember we need to try to, if we remember the marches a few years ago, we need to create trust with, with the public. And if you take all the hardworking men and women of the police department that are putting their lives on the line every day, I think they deserve better communication because slight communication nuances that may be seen by somebody as being appropriate politically are detrimental to the working men and women of the police department and they're detrimental to the public. In this case, had had the police chief or whoever wrote that memo just said, there's no way to do it automatically. The data exists to be re recovered manually, but the time to re to to uh, calculate that would be um, would be very costly or something like that. It would have been a lot more transparent. And then in the article, um, the administration doubles down, and then they ask Axon put Axon on the spot to have a letter to prove that what they said was true. The simple way to resolve this would have been to say. Look, we misunderstood the question. We, th we, we, we thought you meant an easy way to do it. There is a difficult way to do it, but there's not an easy way to do it. Instead, we went through all these machinations of different kinds of communication. And my point is, we just need to be honest and direct with the public. It's the same thing going on right now. You know, I asked a question a few weeks ago about the violent crime rate in Tampa going up. And the, the TPD is not, not the hardworking men and women, but the communication department is putting out infographic after infographic about about how it's not going up. And what they're doing is they're slicing the information in ways that benefits their narrative. And an example is one of the narratives is, is that, um, uh, or one of the data points is that uh, violent crime involving uh, guns is going down. Okay, but what they're leaving out is that the murder rate is going up at a very high rate and aggravated assault is going up. Let's, instead of trying to skew the information to somebody's political agenda, let's just be honest with the public. Let's talk about what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. And if, if violent crime involving guns is down, but violent crime involving knives is up, let's address the issue. Let's talk about it in a constructive way with the public. Let's not put out uh, uh, information with a political agenda because it's not fair to the public. It confuses the public. Um, it's not fair to us, and it's definitely not fair to the people who are putting their lives on the line every day to defend our community. Thank you. Councilman Walter. Um, I appreciate what uh, my colleagues have said, and this is, to me, also an issue of transparency. And <clears throat> it's interesting. I was on a ride-along Tuesday night um, with an officer who just said how much he loves his camera. He actually has like this special thing on the dash where he leaves it on the dash, so when he gets to a somewhere he can see like maybe a car that has moved or something like that and so then he puts it on himself when he goes to the actual um 
to, to approach a subject. And it was really very interesting to get the, the um, he just said how much he really loved being able to go back and use the, da use the video to see whether or not they were right or wrong. And, um, and so I like that, and I like that each individual officer has the ability to go back and look at their things and that, that, um, that their superiors can do the same. But definitely the ability to just see how the entire department uses it, maybe different shifts, all of that would be really valuable. Um, more so, I mean, also for the, absolutely for the public, but also for managerial reasons. Just how often are we using this? Why are we using it? Um, and then we can have the community conversation about whether a mute feature is really good or bad for the community. But it's really, it's, it really is all about transparency. And so I look forward to hearing um, your progress in the ability to do that. I'm, I'm sure other jurisdictions are also interested in similar data. So thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And item number eight. Good morning, Council Chief Tripp, Barbara Tripp from Temple Fire Rescue. Um, Happy New Year. Glad to see everyone. Um, I just wanted to review the actual agenda item that was um, mentioned, and it's pretty much says to provide an update report on District 7 um, and compliance with the Public Safety Master Plan. So pretty much I haven't done a master plan just for one district. I'm actually working on one for the entire city of Tampa. But um, City Council Member um, Vieira, I will give you an update as far as your district, if that's what you want. And may I, Mr. Chairman? Councilman Vieira. Yeah, and, and I'll speak after you're finished and Local 754 is finished. Um, the, the, the intent of the motion was not for the public safety master plan as it applies to District 7, obviously, and I'm going to be talking about all of the city of Tampa. What I was, what I was originally inquiring on was on what's going to that million dollars in the budget going to be spent on if you knew. Um, and then dealing with response times in New Tampa and then prospects of a new station in North Tampa and just seeing where we're at on that. And then the status of the overall public safety master plan, I'll go into detail in terms of what this council has done on that issue, but that's what we're looking at. So absolutely, I don't, I don't expect you to do a whole presentation and I, I appreciate that. Okay, so I'll, I'll pretty much give you an update and I start off with uh, bike in 2019, January, before I even got in this position, a new station was open, which uh, included a um, fire engine, a rescue transport unit, as well as uh, aerial ladder. That was station 23 that was put in place. Since I've been in this position, um, November of 2020, November of 2020 um, and of course speaking before city councils, there was a request of uh, assistance needed up in the North Tampa area. So within that, what we did, we re relocated some units and actually put some units in service to help with the call volume that was in North Tampa. That included moving truck uh, 13, to a different location, but able to respond within that area. We increased, we add another engine to that area to help with the call volume. A rescue car was also put in right when I was making that transition. So right now we have two engines and two rescue cars coming out of station 13. The call volume has assisted as far as leveling out between the, t the multiple units. Uh, with that, uh, and that took place in March of 2021. Um, as I look to see what else could be done to help with the North Tampa area, the conversation and the plan was to take old fire station 11, reconvert it, and put uh, two transport units because as I've always stated in my uh, comments over the last couple of years, we've been running right at 90,000 calls, 80,000 of them medical calls. So the goal is to add what is needed and that's medical response. So with that being said, we converted station, old station uh, 11 into um, to have two ALS transport units coming out of there. Now, even though that was in District 6, but it actually backs up District 7 and District 5. So it actually helped that North Tampa area. The call volume, the unit, um, our utilization has actually decreased, you know, when it comes to each individual unit, okay? 
So to continue with District 7, um, in March of 2022, I received a letter memo from you concerning about the heavy rescue, the mini heavy rescue that was stored at Supply. I did have a plan for that, but because your memo, I pretty much wanted to put that in use because you are correct. Uh, downtown Tampa was the only unit that when it comes to a heavy rescue response, they took a good 30, 40 minutes to get up there. So yes, one was needed up there. In the budget, I asked for two heavy rescue cars, I mean, I'm sorry, heavy rescue units. And basically we just went to Wisconsin, we did our pre-con, they should be here within a year. So with that in service, um, I actually implemented to new heavy rescue, which is the mini, which we uh, made some changes. It's at station 21 now. Uh, we put additional equipment on there as well as personnel to be able to use that type of equipment and to be able to respond to increase the level of service when it comes to heavy rescue in that area. Um, within the last year, as I stated, we have um, added, we cleaned all of the stations. All of the stations have been cleaned even in District 7. We're repaving uh, Station 20, the pavement out there, which are going to place this week, uh, next week. We um, replaced Station 21 AC system that was done in 2022, and we implemented um, all of our truck companies to become ALS, that increased the level of service throughout the city of Tampa. With that being said, three of those units are in District 7, which is truck 13, truck 21, and truck 23. So the increase of services in that. So as we speak now, now that we have um, identified some other concerns with station 24, well, I'm sorry, with engine 24, I need to find a station. I have been working with other departments as well as real estate trying to locate the appropriate place to put station 24. My goal is to put it in the USF area to help with that response time because based on the heat, you know, as far as the call volumes, that's where the area is, is needed. So with that said, I think that's pretty much as an update for District 7, if you have any questions. Um, Councilman Vieira. I mean, I, 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 and thank you very much for that, Chief Tripp. We also invited um, Tampa Firefighter 754 to come up. I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if before we take questions or statements, you wanted to have them speak as well, or? Right, let's, let's ask, uh, is there any comments or questions for Chief Tripp? And okay, we'll I, I, uh, I don't have, well, I'll tell you what, let, let me ask you, with regards to the public safety master plan, because um, I also asked for just the status of that, um, that and, and I'll go through the timeline when I speak after uh, uh, Local 754 speaks, et cetera. Um, where are we at with that? I don't want you to go into the specifics of it, but are we looking at like a document? Has a consultant been retained, et cetera? Where are we at with that? So like in 2021, we did um, get an outside source to come in and do analysis of the city of Tampa when it comes to response time. Mm -hmm. So that is with that information that was relayed, the results of that is what has allowed me to make the changes that we've made throughout the city. But if you want something documented as far as the master plan that I've been working on, and of course all of this is coming out of that master plan, mm -hmm. I can finalize my you know master plan and present it to the entire council. Yeah, you know, and I appreciate that. I'm sorry, ma'am, were you? No, I'm saying I can present it to the entire council okay, for the entire Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, because that's, that's what I've been looking for. I'm gonna go through some of the history of what this council has requested on that. Um, it, it, uh, uh, for, for all of us, of course, including yourself, first and foremost, there's a sense of great urgency on this. My idea with this was to see where all of our deficits are at throughout all of our city of Tampa. Uh, we began this council by looking at East Tampa and, and fire needs there. Councilman Goods dealt with a lot of issues there. The North Tampa, my idea is to have, we've been talking about it for I think two and a half, three years now, is to have one report where we can look at, I believe Tampa uh, uh, Police Department does this, but one report where we can see all of our citywide deficits whenever it comes to Tampa Fire Rescue. So then we can create a plan to remedy those deficits, talk about a monetary plan, whether it's more revenue, whatever it may be, to talk about those citywide deficits. When I look throughout all of our city at Tampa, obviously not just North and New Tampa, uh, we're talking about Water Street and the, the serious issues that are there. We see on West Shore continuing needs there. West Tampa, a lot of workforce housing being built there. South of Gandy, I know Councilman Carlson's talked a lot about that and that's gonna be coming up. So I, I wanna see a comprehensive report that allows us to make that policy decision collaboratively with the mayor 
on our deficits and how to reach them. That's kind of what, what I'm looking for, but, uh, but, but I, I appreciate it. And I have no problem, of course, getting in this position and how things took <clears throat> place. I was given nothing. So pretty much I'm starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. So over the last year and a half is when I've been able to accumulate a lot of the areas and stuff and where the needs are, you know. So pretty much I've been working with all of the departments, with uh, chief of staff to make sure that we try to get something implemented. But if you want an actual document, I have no problem creating one for the entire council to let you know what I've worked on, what I'm working on, and what is the plan for the future of Tampa Fire Rescue, as long as I'm in position. Yes, ma'am, and, and I appreciate that, because again, I, I want us to be able to make that public policy decision with the public to talk about the economic uh, uh, bridge to get to remedying our public safety deficits, because I think the public deserves to know where those deficits are at and how much it would cost uh, to remedy those deficits. That's a really, really big issue in terms of transparency for the public, uh, financial bridges to get to where our needs are. So, and, and I'll speak some more after 754, but thank you. Councilman Goods. Chief, thank you for the, the report. <clears throat> Just like I, it's like you called me and talked to me, I talked to the, the union presidents to hear their concerns, everyone concerns. Uh, and it's a balance, it's a balance. Uh, you got a new president now, it's over there. You're the new fire chief, so he has a plan. You come in, you've got a plan because when any, any, any manager, manager of team takes over, they bring some ideas and everybody has an ideas. So I'm hoping that you and him are gonna work together to get what those ideas out there for the best for uh, all of our firefighters. When you talk about the call volume, uh, we, we, we put those two rescue cars up there. The city is growing. But I'm glad you talked about still, you know the calls are still growing, even though you put the two units up there and looking at getting another station up there somewhere to help out, because that volume's gonna increase in that area with the building that's going on. So I'm glad you did kind of talk about that. Uh, and, and again, the, the master plan, looking at, looking at ways that we look at the whole city as a whole. Mm -hmm. I'm appreciative of that because I always say downtown uh, in Channelside, we get a major issue. We, I don't think we have the apparatuses to do what we need to do. Uh, I'm, I'm very afraid of that. So hopefully within the master plan, that's going to incorporate. So Mr. Vera is right. We need to get a bond to revamp because I look at Station 10. It's a dump. It's old. You know, some of these stations are very old and need to be fixed up around the city. Port Tampa down there. I mean, South Tampa, Mr. Carlson's at. Uh, so if, you know, we, if this council needs to approve money, uh, public safety is number one. Uh, and especially we talking about people's lives and, you know, the police are important, but I tell you, that fire rescue car and that, that fire is very important to getting it to the people. And I'm sure this council wants to make sure we give you and the union what you need to be successful. So I'm looking forward to the master plan. I know we talked about the, the radios and the CAD system. I know you're working on the radio system and the CAD system. Uh, so I know that's coming forward. So hopefully we'll have that in front of council within the next couple of weeks or month so we can get that going because it's been a long time coming from that. So we're glad to hear about the report on that system. I know that's something that I was passionate about back in 2020 when we talked about <coughs> the system. Uh, and again, you realize that that system did not work. It's not <coughs> compatible with what we need. And you, you did the research to find what areas with the population we have to find a system that you believe that's going to work. So hopefully we'll get that in sooner versus than later and the union will be happy with that. So. Again, I just want to applaud you for your, your, your efforts to trying to move the needle because you, you, you came in at a time that there's a lot of issues and you know, you're the boss now, so you're trying to figure your way. And then again, you got the union, so hopefully we can still mesh together and get it all worked out so everybody can be happy and we, we have a great city. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. You and I had a long conversation yesterday, the day before, and I have a lot of confidence in your ability um, uh, to, to handle this and strategize about it and uh, and um, you you seem to have a very good plan in your head <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing it presented to everyone um, you, you know constituents throughout the at the city are frustrated because you know for years there was a focus on investing in downtown and the rest of the city to some extent was ignored and um, uh, they want to know why uh, they're not getting the resources they need and this affects a lot of different areas and we at we city council have been waiting for several years on a citywide sidewalk plan, a citywide bicycle plan, a citywide mobility plan, which includes roads, which people want, um, citywide parks plan. They want to know why the benches are falling apart. They want to know why their roads are almost impassable, that their cars are breaking. And they want to know why, like what happened a couple weeks ago, uh, someone passed away. Um, you know, the allegation in the community was that 
that a, a, there was not a truck that was able to get there fast enough. Whether that's true or not, somebody else will decide. But um, we all know that in this area, we need more investment and we need more coverage. And you believe that. Um, there are limited dollars. Um, and as my colleague, uh, uh, Charlie Miranda says we're going to lose the CIT money, which really scares me uh, because of uh, we need more investment in in uh, public safety, not less. I want to thank uh, my colleague, Councilmember Vieira, for proposing a citywide public safety plan. That's exactly what we need. We need with all of these citywide plans, we need to be able to go to the public and say that that the plans and priorities, and not just the um, the deficits, but also the priorities, uh, were set by public input, but also by an objective standard. Um, uh, the, um, the union also a couple years ago, I think it was Mr. Greco or somebody presented the GPS study that they had done, which showed coverage areas, and I hope you'll utilize that as well. Um, the, the issue is that we need to be able to tell the public that solutions are coming, uh, but if, if the response time in one area is is 15 minutes and the response time is another area is 20 minutes, we need to be able to tell them, look, we want to solve that 10 minute problem, but we got to solve the 20 minute problem first. And so uh, different parts of the city will understand that, that they might need to sacrifice for a little bit longer. If someone in my district says, why is it that there's a pothole every other foot on my street and we all pay a lot of taxes, why is it that happening? It's not enough just to tell them that the road repair budget is every 70 years. They want to know when in the rotation they're going to be. Um, so on, on, on fire safety, we desperately need more coverage in South Tampa. Um, we can each make a political play and, and, and rally people to defend our areas and try to get us at a higher priority. I think what everybody understands in the public is an objective standard. And so I hope when you come back that you'll um, show equity throughout the city. Um, and South Tampa has to be included there too. South of Gandy, as they've come before us, has a lot more density than they used to have. The rest of South Tampa has a lot more density than they used to have. Many thousands more people are living there. And when you talk to the firefighters, there's just not enough people to cover it, especially the one unit you and I talked about is also a Marine unit. And I went with them out to the boat and if they're out on the boat, it, they, it, it takes a lot longer to respond. You understand that uh, there's a space in Port Tampa that you're, that's on your long-term list to maybe reactivate. I know at one station you're maybe looking to put a rescue car. Just putting rescue cars in would be a lot better because if you have to take a ladder truck to go to an overdose or a heart attack, um, it makes it a lot more complicated and it puts wear and tear on trucks that are already too old. So I want to support you. The only thing I ask is that, is that um, you work with the union and their data with the GPS and everything and that you come back to us with an equitable objective plan so that we can go to the public and say, yes, we're gonna provide more services, but here's the timeline for when we're gonna do it. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my, my colleague Carlson and Goods alluded to, when, when you look at what we're facing, whoever sits in these seven chairs in the next election is gonna have the last bite of the apple of the community investment tax. But that apple first bite starts with the coming 23-24 budget. Because in there is where you're gonna have the step forward to either move or stay exactly where you're at. And you have another problem that hasn't been mentioned. It's not only the lack of, but the traffic situation that we have now where it used to take 10 minutes, now may take a unit 15 or 20 minutes because it is impossible to move around the city because we're growing. And, and these are the things that bring up some delays, not only the need for expansion to make sure you have the coverage according to the statistics that are necessary for the fire department and police department to do. Going back to the, the budget item, the public doesn't understand or doesn't know to understand because it's not publicized enough that even in this year's budget, if you collected all the money from ad valorem taxes and you apply it to the police and fire, you're still 25, almost $26 million short of funding the people that we need to do the work for the city. So those are things that it has to be addressed and uh, it's imperative that we have every city that has great response time, great police coverage, wonderful people working goes forward. <coughs> those that don't die out because people don't wanna live where they feel threatened by themselves that they don't have the opportunity to save someone's life.
But the men and women of both the fire department and the police department are always number one, in our opinion anyway. So these are the things that are needed, and I think the administration thinks the same way. I can't speak for them. But these are the things along with Mr. Vieira's seven. It's not only the seven. It's the whole city now because you had growth of 14, 18 percent all over the city. And those are the things that are we have to keep up with the time, and the time is now. It can't be tomorrow because tomorrow will be too late. You got one more bite at the apple, y después se acabó, which means the end. Like you're looking at your watch, it is the end. Thank you very much. Any other comments for Councilman Vieira? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and a couple of things. I wanted to make sure it's clear. This report, when it applies to seven, was only on the million dollars budget for seven, not the public safety master plan. That's actually why I proposed a public safety master plan so that we wouldn't deal with districts going, you know, maybe New Tampa says, hey, four out of the six uh, uh, longest response stations are in 33647, <clears throat> that maybe south of Gandy or west uh, Tampa or somewhere else has a more acute need. Let's have it based upon objective facts throughout all of our city uh, freely and without uh, need of politics. And for uh, Chief Tripp, let me ask you, with regards to that, um, I guess it is in, in February, I think we continued it to, is that enough time for you? Because let me ask, um, you're, you're saying now it can be in writing. Is this something Tampa Fire Department's going to be doing, or is there a consultant or a contractor retained for it? Because, I mean, in other words, do you need more time for it till March? Because my original motion a year, two years ago, was it to be presented in March of each year. So I'm asking you now, do you need more time, you think, for I mean, a I'll consultant? Give you the, or? I can give you the master plan of what I have and what I would like to see for Tampa Fire, you know, based on the results that we got from that study. Are, so it all depends on... So I hear every one of you all, okay? Mm -hmm. I just have to make a statement. What I'd inherited is something that won't be able to be taken care of over 24 hours, mm -hmm. okay? Now, I inherited a history of um, over 127 years of a department that, in my opinion, I've been here 25 years, that have been behind time. I feel like we're 10 years behind. I have equipment that's front line that's 1992. That's totally unacceptable, mm -hmm. okay? My rescue cars, five-year front line, five-year reserve. Ten years, they should be gone. I have vehicles that are now 12 years old that are front line, okay? That's what Chief Tripp has been working on day and night, mm -hmm. okay? So I hear you. When I got in this position, I got in here to try to make a difference and to help this, the fire department, okay? Personnel, since I've been in this position, 104 firefighters, or since last year, 104 firefighters. I got 23 more coming on. I'm still down another 50 employees, okay? I can't put units in places where I don't have the seats for them, the, the people to fill the seats, okay? Not only that, since I've been in this position, not to mention COVID, we have had a bike order on equipment. So my rescue cars that are pretty much outdated out of service, it's a 24 month delay to even get a chassis. I ordered 15 rescue cars last year. Okay, I only have two, <coughs> two just came in. I have another three that's planning on coming in round about April of May of next year, keeping my fingers crossed. The other 10, they haven't even started building yet. So there's nothing, when you sit here and say, we need to get this done, I agree with you. I go back to Councilmember Carson. I was stationed at Station 15, okay? When I went back, my daughter's 22 years old. For, them, for that to be the only rescue car that's in South Tampa and as much as South Tampa, South Again, it has grown, to me, that's totally unacceptable. That has been on my list since I've been in this position, but once again, I got to get butts to put in the seats. So I hear everything you're saying. That is in my head. That's what I've been working on for these last two years to try to get this done. Every chance I get, I hire. Every chance I get, I bring on. I've, I've pretty much taxed the uh, HR department, you know, because I'm like, okay, we need to open it up again. We need to open it up again. I'm interviewing. My panel is interviewing. Matter of fact, we got an interview going on now. So when it comes to putting equipment, just like I told uh, Council Member Carson, my plan is definitely to put a unit down there because it's overdue. But I got to get butts in the seats first and it's gonna take place within the first quarter of this year. Not to mention I have other places to put butts in the seats 
because we need it all over. We're behind. Tampa is growing. So with that, when you ask or demand all of this, just make sure you take all of that into consideration. Personnel, equipment. I know money is definitely the you know, number one object here as well, but personnel and equipment. If the manufacturers cannot make me a rescue car or a truck, I can't do nothing about it. I have, um, when I say motor vehicles, that's outdated. Engines, rescue cars, special event units. My hit hazmat, I'm sorry, my heavy rescue, we just ordered two. I believe it's 12 years old. The area ladder that's down here, I think it's 10, 12, going on 15 years. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of equipment, in my opinion, that have not been taken care of in order to get to this point where we need to. I'm working on it. And if I may. Councilman Vera. Thank you. And, and that's why it actually supports my question, which is the original motion was for March. Do you want more time to present this to maybe, uh, if, if you need a consultant, a contractor? That's what I'm asking. Do you need more time given those many issues? I okay. Don't. Just making sure. Mr. Chair? Councilman, Councilman Goods, I'm going to Councilman Maniscalco first, and then I'll come back. First, a motion to extend to 1230. Yes, I was going to say that. Second. Yes. All right. Uh, motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 1230 it is. Thank you very much. And you said it, you know, I mean, you don't have the bodies. You don't, you have outdated equipment. You don't have enough. I mean, you, you, you're trying to do your best with what limited uh, ability there is here. And uh, when you're talking about you know, equipment from 1992, you're eligible for an antique license plate in the state of Florida, I think. I mean, and that's unacceptable. When you're talking about when seconds count, you know, you need to be there. We can't have situations where there's not a, a quick enough response time because there's the inability to do so. So, you know, something that was brought up and a concern of mine is the CIT expires and it's right around the corner. And I don't know if that's going to be renewed. I was always hopeful, but it's got to be a county initiative, and I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I remember um, reading that in 1987, maybe, uh, under the Freeman administration, that there was a millage increase, and that was to hire more police officers, I think. And uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the options are, but you're saying that you're short-staffed. Uh, you're saying that uh, you're, you're short-staffed of, of equipment uh, and outdated equipment, and the manufacturers aren't making it quick enough. We just have to look at all options. You know, when it comes to public safety, uh, we can't mess around with this. We've delayed enough, and you're here trying to work with the catching up of that. Uh, we need to look at all options and see how we catch up because the city is growing very, very quickly. And in that, you know, we need to uh, improve the quality of service. So whatever we can do to help you, uh, we will help you, but we have to look at all the avenues of how to fund that and move forward. Thank you. Councilman Goose. Chief, with the equipment, is there only a certain limited number of companies that make it? Or I'm thinking like, I'm, I mean, I'm thinking like it's a car lot. I think we got rescue units or a certain style you look for that, you, that we use here that's making the backlog? So the problem is the chassis. So we know Ford got a problem with the chassis. Any chassis, I don't care what um, brand, vehicle, model, whatever, it's the chassis, you know, in order to get these built. We actually um, moved to another company closer to Florida, well, in Florida, uh, that's right out of Winter Park for a couple of reasons. A little bit cheaper, economic, and it's local, okay? Same problem. So what do we do? The one here or the one in Ohio is still a bike log on the chassis. Isn't there one in Ocala, too? You drive down the interstate, you always see those fire engines, fire trucks down there, shelter. <laughs> well, that is the one that's for us making rescue cars. Now, they do oh. engines. You know, they do engines, but the one that we're dealing with is um, um, over in Winter Park area. And, and the last thing, in your master plan, will it talk about the response time from the units at the hospital? Uh, in, in reference to, I know they say Pinellas and other places, that the rescue units, they drop the patient off, they're not waiting there, and then the hospital's not taking responsibility. Would that be in there? Or, or to look at... Uh, our response times, where our system's coming, getting back into service? Now, the only problem that we're going to have with that, I can try to put some information in there, but when it comes to the hospital, of course, we can't tell the hospital to take this patient. You know, there have been conversation, but with COVID, COVID had put a lot because they didn't have the resources there to receive the patients. It has gotten better. 
I can tell you that it has gotten better. So we actually have more or less like a 45 minute wait time at the um, hospitals. And if the unit is not available, they have to respond and let us know why they're not available. And usually we get in touch with management at the hospital, say, hey, what's the hold up? And they'll tell us or they'll try to release our units as quick as possible. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Let's go with uh, local 754, the new president. I was going to say good morning, but now good afternoon. Good afternoon, council, city staff, those listening in. <clears throat> I am Nick Stocko, the newly elected president of local 754 Tampa Firefighters. I'm going to apologize in advance for reading this to you all. Speaking for, before council is somewhat new to me, and English was not my first language. I would like to take a few minutes of your time to speak on this motion. Originally, this motion was made by Councilman Vieira in early 2020 for a public safety master plan for fire rescue. Additionally, this motion was to have a yearly status report. Since that motion, Local 754 has presented a GIS study on the emergency services response capabilities analysis. This 135 page document was given to all city council, city staff, and the administration over two years ago. The study used data from the city of Tampa CAD system, which is the computer aided dispatch to find where Tampa Fire Rescue is lacking in resources and or personnel. On March 25, 2021, TFR administration presented in council chambers a state of Tampa Fire Rescue. The administration spoke on how far behind we are in regards to apparatus and their life expectancy, our technology, and the communication systems to include AVLs, which is automatic vehicle locators, and the shortage of station personnel at that time. 17 engines were beyond life expectancy, six of which are front lines. 17 rescues were beyond life expectancy, five of which were front line. Two ladder trucks were beyond life expectancy, one of which was front line. It has been years since TFR has had an operational AVL, and the fire chief is currently working on RFPs to get our department back in the 21st century with the needed technology. Over the last 60 years, the city of Tampa has been growing significantly, and in that time frame, TFR has not added any additional fire stations to the city proper. Okay. We have a, a sheet here that we'd like to just show. Um, Can we have the overhead, please? Please. It's the 2022 calls for service data sheet. Upside down. Can, can you all see it? Or? No, 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 there we go. Bless you. Can I have coffee for you? To give you a little perspective, in 2010, TFR responded to 66,960 calls for service. In 2022, TFR responded to 92,056 calls for service. That's almost a 50% increase. The lion's share of these calls are coming from inside the boundaries of Tampa City proper. The latest addition was Fire Station 25 housing two rescue units. Initially, the station was presented as an engine and rescue station. The two rescue units were converted from peak units to full-time units and relocated from other areas of the city to 712 East Fairbanks. While the area surrounding Fire Station 25 got two rescues, the city did not gain any additional units. Water Street is booming. Nine million square feet of mixed-use property into one urban space. The GIS study in 2020 indicates that this would double the size of downtown Tampa skyline and the number of high-rises. The current downtown fire station, Station 1, houses the third busiest engine company, the fifth busiest rescue company, and the busiest ladder truck company in the city, which was just mentioned to be 15 years old. Is TFR capable of meeting the demands of the city inside itself? To speak on Chief Tripp's comments of making the ladder truck companies in ALS or advance, that is a decade behind overdue. And thank you, Chief, that was well needed. However, equipped vehicles do not alleviate response times. 
Water Street is not the only area in Tampa being developed. Midtown, Gasworks, West River area, West Shore, West Shore Gandy, just to name a few. This is why a public safety master plan is critical to identify the public safety needs of our rapidly growing city. As we just heard, developers are developing. Is public safety? The studies have been done. Now it's time to put a plan in action. The city is growing and our fire department should be growing at the same rate to keep up with the demand. The longer we wait, the further we'll be behind. Let's implement the program. Just yesterday, TFR responded in New Tampa of reports of a pediatric patient with a traumatic injury. The closest engine company was 13 minutes away and the responding rescue company or ambulance was 17 minutes away. At the same time, eight TFR rescues were awaiting beds for transfer at the local emergency room. This is a Wednesday at 2 p.m. New Tampa is not the only area of the city where we're seeing long responses. As you all may have seen recently in the news, we're seeing, long, see, seeing the same long response times in the South Tampa area. Some may say, when needing an ambulance, it's quicker to get an Uber. In closing, we've got to do the right thing, not just for the citizens of Tampa, but for the members of Local 754 that serve this great city. If it's finances, get creative. You can replace the money, but you can't raise, replace the lives. Now let's start saving some lives. Thank you. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, thank you for this, and uh, I agree with you, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you are working with the Chief to do as much as you can. When it comes to funding, one of the things that, that I've heard talked about and I think we need to bring up again is uh, a public safety impact fee. I think, um, I, I don't think developers are going to have a huge issue with the fact that they're bringing in more people. I mean, how else, if when the, when the CIT goes away, what else can we do? And that may be something that we should really take a, a closer look at. Um, that's, that's just where I would like to come with that because that would be a continuous, um, as long as we're having development, redevelopment, that would be a continuous um, uh, flow of funds. Councilman Goods. Chief, uh, you've heard what the union has said, and you pretty much talked about a lot of what uh, the president has said earlier. Uh, manpower as well is a key with some of the things you're talking about. Uh, if I got nobody to respond to calls, I don't have any bodies. So I see you're trying to get the bodies up. Uh, we talked about the back order of the cars. You're trying to get those in too. Uh, the master plan. I think that's going to be key. I think for me, I talked about this from day one, and I don't know if the city can do this. I don't know if our zoning department can do it, but when they're talking about building these big old buildings down here, I don't know if there could be something in our zoning saying you must put a bottom lever down there so we can have a, a rescue car or something in that area uh, to respond. I don't know if we can do that or not. That may, may be a question that I'll leave up the union union to get with them, and if, if something needs to be made, we can come back here and make a motion and see what all these new buildings going up. If we can be able to have those bottom levers like other northern cities have, those units can respond. I mean, that's another way of, of uh, probably captivating uh, some dollars maybe to help that developer or, or uh, in some type of incentive to, to put in those certain areas. I think that's, that's key. I said from day one, you, we've got to start doing that and maybe some of these other parts of the city when they're building a lot of this stuff, hey, can we, can we, can we uh, lease down there? Can we get in a proportion of those buildings? And, and that can, we can increase uh, what we need. Uh, the rescue times, you know, I, I talked about the hospitals. I know that's a big thing with uh, the unions are talking about the hospitals. So maybe that needs to be a conversation with, again, with you and Tampa General again and, and these other hospitals to see well, what, can we, what can we do. Uh, at 45 minutes, I think it's too long for unions to be sitting at a hospital. Uh, it's a long time, and, 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 and uh, again, we, we can't control what hospitals do, but maybe there's a, can't say what we can't do, but what we can do, because um, that, that is a long time, because this is the police department, I need to go 10-8 from the jail, I, need, I can't wait so long, so I gotta, we, we gotta get those units moving, so hopefully that's a conversation that you, the union, can have with the hospitals and see how we can fix that a little bit better. You mentioned already, you got COVID, you, a lot of these things you talked about already, you, 
So it's not, it's not like you ain't doing the work. It's like we just got to be able to get it implemented, get dollars and cents to do what we got to do. So I, I think we're both on the same page. We just got to just got to get it done somehow, and what this council's help to get it done. But I believe that you you all are saying the same exact things, and you've got a plan. But again, you know, what can you do if if they don't have the chassis to to get it to us? You know, so I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we can go someplace else. I don't know. But again, I, I hear y'all saying the same things. We just got to work together just to get it done, and we'll help do that. Thank you. Again, again thank you. Congratulations on being chosen as <coughs> the leader of uh, 754. Uh, it's imperative that any city that is growing keeps up with the demand for fire and police. Because if you don't, the public loses confidence in that city. The public, number one thing in any city is the fire department and the police department, no matter what city you're in. That's paramount that we do that. And I believe this council and hopefully other councils in the future will continue to work on this problem to solve the situation that you're in. All of us are in. You're in it. We're in it too with you. It's not that we're against you or you're against us. No, everybody's in the same pool. And that's behind the eight ball because we haven't had the opportunity to catch up. And the district that we talked about, all the city, but the one just east of us is one that needs services a lot because you have a lot of tall buildings, a lot of information, a lot of people living there in a condensed area, and if something goes, it'll have to spread quicker than we can think about it happening because of the proximity of the closeness of all the buildings. So the, these are the things that we have to look at, and it's up to this council and this mayor to try to work it out for the next coming budget to at least open the door to how we're going to solve this problem. It's going to take years. It ain't going to be one year or two years. This is going to take some time to get it done. But uh, hopefully that we can do what is necessary for the people. We take care of the people. We take care of the, of the equipment and the men and women in the fire department. So it's, we take care of the citizens. We take care of everybody. Thank you very much for what you've done in the past as your firefighter and what you're going to do as a leader of your union. Councilman Vieira. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and Nick, a great uh, 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 speech and, and whatnot. You know, whether or not you and, and the chief are on the same page, I think is really there's the tall view, and then we have what's going to be coming in February, and I think that's really what we're going to see. And I think that's what's really, really critical, which is we have the 754 study. In the absence of anything else in writing, that's what I go with. And, and, I, and, and something that's really important, and one, somebody from the union mentioned this to me before, and it's so important, is that study is pre-COVID. Um, so when you take a look at numbers, even maybe in the last nine months, it's not what we typically see in Tampa. And as people get out, and 95% maybe of people have, um, numbers are gonna continue to develop and change with regards to res uh, public safety responses, et cetera. Um, I, I sensing you, in, in seeing you today, and in, in, as I always see you, a great sense of passion and urgency. And I share that 110% the urgency. Um, you said that developers are developing. Is public safety? That's a big question. Uh, we've dealt with public um, safety impact fees. I, I, if we can do them, I'd support them 110%. We have to have a discussion on potentially revenue and other sources for this. This is a need. All of our city of Tampa supports our firefighters and our police officers. Virtually all of the city does. And, um, and if people have to take a look at other revenue sources that are reasonable and limited, et cetera, such as that, I think 99% of people would support that because people support our first responders. But I wanted to thank you so much for uh, all the hard work it took to uh, uh, put all that information together. And God bless you guys. Sir, you want to address Mr. Massey next, sir? Councilman Goods. Mr. Massey, didn't, didn't a while back we ask about a, uh, a, a tax uh, um, uh, uh, safety impact tax. Uh, I can't recall. Did we finish the finale on that? Uh? There was. Council made several motions uh, a couple years ago about the possibility of imposing a public safety impact fee. We, I, our office, I uh, provided a report to council saying that that is legally possible, but this, there is the Florida legislature had certain requirements that we have to meet. So we'd have to do an analysis. We'd have to, it, it, there, you just can't impose it. You have to go through a, a hearing process. It can't happen overnight. That's the, so there's a defined process in state law 
And so that's where the report stood. And there, at that point in time, I just I think that's things stalled at that point in time. So, so. we stalled it. Yeah. All right. Well, we need to take another look at that. Nifty, if that's the case. Anything else? I. It, go ahead, Chair. No, I'm going to have last word. Mm -hmm. uh, as Councilwoman Hertek Goods, and as we just heard, uh, you know, the developers are coming and. With that growth, they still utilize our services. So if it, if it isn't um, going to happen overnight, we work overnight. And if that's what we got to do on the union side, we're going to work. And uh, whatever it is that anyone needs from us to facilitate, the resources will be available. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilwoman Hurtag. Um, uh, my office will work on a motion to uh, bring that back, take a look at it again to see what we can do. Um, because if it's a long road, then we need to get it started. Chief, you are coming back on February 23rd. Sure. <laughs> it, was that your motion? Yeah, and for 754, of course, yeah. also similar with the same. Okay. Um, that's all right. Can I say one other word? I yes, know please, Trip. I, I just happened to hear Chief something Trip. about a motion uh, being passed in 2020 to do a yearly master plan. So, my apologies, I didn't know anything about that. If this was something that was done in what month it was. If, if I may answer. That, thank you. That, that was originally brought up, I think, in February of 2020. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, before your time, right. right? I just want um, to make sure that yeah. I did what I was supposed to do because I didn't know anything about a yearly master yeah. plan to be presented to council. Yeah, that, that, and that's what I was saying, again, th about three years in total. But yeah, thank you. Anyone else? We need a motion, Madam Clerk. Motion. What? Do you need to make a motion? Mr. Council Member Vieira, did you, did you need a date for February? Um, I can, after uh, the chairman speaks, I can do that. Thank you, Mr. Vieira. Uh, Chief Tripp, thank you very much for your report that you gave today. This is going to take a collaborative effort from a lot of people. We have CAD, which is going to take IT. We're going to have to look at the, uh, the, the industries in which supply the fire trucks. We're going to have to look at a lot of different things. I would like to see the ratio of population to firefighter, fire rescue, come more in balance. We're going to need more staff. That's already been said. We can have all the brand new buildings we want, all the brand new fire rescue trucks we want. But again, as Chief Tripp said, we need uh, seats in the butts in the seats. City of Tampa is very unique. Our population doubles each and every day from 7 in the morning to 7 p.m. So it's not only the citizens of Tampa that we need to keep safe with fire and police. But it's all the people, also the people coming in from Pasco, Polk, Hernando, Manatee, Sarasota counties, Pinellas, they come here each and every day to work. I'm looking forward to your report, Chief Tripp, and I'm looking forward to hearing also from 754 on how we can make this fire department better. But without this report, we don't know how to budget ourselves to make sure that we can implement it. Chief Tripp, thank you very much. Nick, thank you and, and your staff very much for being here today. May I make a motion? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. So I motion, if I may, for February 23rd of 2023 for Tampa Fire Rescue and Local 754 to come, uh, for um, Tampa Fire Rescue to come with a written report uh, on the Public Safety Master Plan. I would also request, if possible, obviously, they give it before um, uh, sufficient time for Local 754 to review to be able to prepare and that both sides be able to speak. And, and Chief, again, I say this, I'll, I'll say this again, if you need more time to march, I say this publicly, let me know, please, that's fine, obviously, because we want something in writing and that's robust, et cetera, and if consultants need to be taken, let's do it. Thank you, Second. and that's it. A motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Is there any opposed? Without objection, we're at recess until 1.30.